that's what I need to know. That's what my whistle is for. Now, with that being said, I do change, I think, okay, let me word it differently. I do pay very close attention to the attitude I think is most conducive to doing the retrieve I'm about to do. And this goes for Mark and Mark. So if the really long line has lots of discipline factors, and length is, a, is one of the factors, no doubt about it, crosswind, water, coming off the point, terrain, going through scent. I mean, if there's lots of discipline factors, I'm definitely going to bear down on them a little bit more online and try to create a more sober, higher concern level state of mind. I mean, I, any dogs that I train, when I do that, uh, what we call sweating. And how do I do that? I do that by being a little more aggressive with my tone and my voice. Uh, I, my hand position is, a, there's, and we'll talk about different types of hands. There's the normal sense, like on a go bird. There's uh, a more intense hand. There's a more of a soft hand, which I would say, and we would call it a casual hand. It's a bird, we don't want to drive it. And then the voice of inflection on the send, and these are on marks, are going to be, are going to vary. So the type of hand I put down, the, the volume and intensity of my voice. It isn't, I'm not going to scream at it, but if I'm telling you, hey, pay attention, heal, sit, Dead bird, here, sit, back. That would be about as far as I would send it. Okay, now, the only time I really cue in a relaxed state on a blind is when I'm running right at a visible gun. If I have, that's one of the, and I don't know if you see it much in your game where you have those tight blinds, but one that goes right at the gun station, and the dogs don't like to go there. Or real skinny water with a dog that wants to be real water. I may, I'm going to try to relax them there. So I rarely say good or right there on a blind retreat, but I will do it when I'm trying to get them to run right at a gun or at some place that's scary to them, that, that their training or their conscience is working against them. What, what do you mean by right at the gun? Where would the blind be? Between, uh, three steps in front of the person. Like, with it, like halfway between you and me at 100 yards with them. Now, in our world, a person sitting in a chair directly at them, and then a dog or a I can't do that. They go left, right, left. And it's, some judges will do that. And, and I oftentimes, and maybe I'll demonstrate one of one of those, what it might look like. Well, we always do, we always make sure that's part of our routine. That triple one, one that goes right at his feet, one that goes right off one side of the gun, one that goes right off the other side. And when I design land tuna drills, I'll, and, and I'll, I think we should all go out there on a little field trip. And, and I'll walk through how I would design a land tuna drill. Because most everybody here could find a piece of property similar to what I'm going to use. And it could be in your front yard, down your driveway. And I think they're probably one of the most valuable <coughs> And water tune-ups, obviously, too. But the whole world of tuna girls. And, and I'm, I'm not, not going to assume, no, hold on, let me get back to this question and I'll launch it on mine, because I didn't answer your question about uh, long and short of marks. I say probably the biggest thing is to be consistent in your cueing process. Now, if I'm going to cue for a long retired gun, a long bird, mark, and I will retire because they're visible and they're not visible. But any situation where there's lots of discipline factors that are going to keep you from getting the distance of the bird, when I cue now, you can't cue prior to signal, but you can cue prior to send it. But what I would do prior to signal is I would, and I put my, I only put, I only cue with a hand marking the guns on two types of birds. A disciplined long single first, like we had on day one, that bird thrown. Now it wasn't super disciplined, but it, if it was longer, it would have been. Or a long retired gun that I'll be 
picking up laps, that there's a tendency to break down short. I gotta go past the flyer station, I gotta go through flyer feathers, and I'm gonna keep and, and prior to signaling, I would drop a hand over the dog and I'd say, mark, and I'd say it just like that. I and I now if I couldn't cue, you, you can say the word mark. You just can't point out the gun, right? So assuming that discipline bird on your set is the first bird shot. I can point him in the direction, I come up, point him in the direction of the first bird being shot. And I say, sit, mark. I'm not gonna go, where's your mark? I'm gonna create the attitude of a disciplined retreat that's about to occur. So to answer your question, being consistent throughout their life on the queuing process, the preset queuing, the nature of which you said, and all of the information you give them prior to leaving on that retreat, when it's done consistently over a course of time, that's what it that teaches them the most. It teaches them what's about to occur and what they're about to encounter and gives them valuable information. Okay? So I'm going to be, for example, when I send out that discipline group, I'm going to be real far forward. I'm going to be, I'm going to be in their space. You know, like that close talker that's really annoying? I'm going to be that close officer. I'm going to be that guy that's right. I'm going to, I'm going to invade their space and I want them to know I'm there and I want to know I'm driving. Sometimes some of those marks are 80% blind and 20% mark. Because if you do all, you know, I want them to be real aware of going where they're pointing. I want them to be real aware of the rules, going straight, going through the water, fighting across with, maybe ignoring scent, if I want them to ignore scent. Those kinds of things, and if I'm just really religious about doing it all the time, even if they're singles, you're really going to enhance that communication and understanding. And I think that's the best way. Now, to watch and just see those long arms, if I'm going to extend them, I'm going to do things like put my tape on birds, I'm going to throw a bird and maybe then throw a bumper after it, something to encourage them to look long. Uh, but as far, I mean, again, and there's a, there's a lot of parts of that question. I think the most valuable answer I can give you is that consistency in pre-sending ritual that goes into the different types of retreats. There's really three types. There's the, the, the more intense, long retired gun discipline send. That's the state. You better stay in the water, dude. You better go through the fire set. You better fight the crossman. There's the middle distance bird that hangs it's a little more of a hybrid. It has maybe what I call a casual hand. The hand comes in and it's here, sit, bite it. it it's not. And then uh, Danielle did this as test dog with a watermark. I said, she easy that dog up on that little discipline watermark on the left. She went, oh, okay, easy. That's my easy cue. But what that does, that kind of says, for the most part, all rules are off. You can do what you want a little bit. You can be relaxed. And I said, I don't like to do that on the water, especially on a cheating watermark, even if it's short, because it kind of gives them license to cheat. The license to go ahead and just, it's like the happy bumper of the I'm going to almost create that happy bumper atmosphere. Because, and I'm going to do that in a situation where, for example, when you, and I'm going to go back to Danielle, because with Slate, the dog that had the rerun yesterday, remember? And, and he ran through the short bird and got the flyer, and then she has to talk him back in there. I had the gun stand up just to kind of get the first ears up. But she spoiled it because she put his hand on she went, Slate! I know. I wanted to run right there. I don't want him to go like that. And, you know, almost like worship. And if you're going to use worship marks for right that's why you, I want to, I want to kind of lean in and puff up, raise your ears up, be relaxed. I'm, I'm telling them, the first feathers you get to, I want you to look for them, you know? And if you're consistent about that, you can, you can do a lot of marks with dogs don't have no clue where the bird is. No clue. I think, I think some of those dogs, you can just shoot a pistol and lay the bird on the ground and never throw anything. 
and there's no dog that could do it better than the dog that saw it through this process. So this leads me into the next thing that I'm just going to, just a little tangent, but I'm going to go on <laughs> The queuing on bars. This is why I don't like to, this is one reason I don't like to go good right there. When I said it on that just a little line, you do it. A lot of people do it because they want to get them to look out, think they see what a bird is. I don't like to do that. I like to get in the habit of teaching them to be told where to go, not being asked where to look. Okay? And I do it for a number of reasons. But one of the unintended side effects of using marking style cues, and they're right there for good, gives the dog a perk up that thinks he sees the, the end of the destination. Because it is, first of all, you run that deal and the dog leaves looking for a bird, not looking for advice. I want a dog to leave on a climb, knowing that I've got the steering wheel. You just got to make good decisions. I'll tell you where the bird is. Don't ask me any questions. Now, I, I find, and, and initially sometimes, it, it's a longer way to get there to get dogs to get confident. Sometimes they go a little bit cautious in, the, in this early stages of you doing it that way. But once they buy in and they go at that nice measured line pace and, and you can read their body language and they, you know that they know that you're in charge, you're in a much better situation than you are with a dog that's just figures he's on a mark that he didn't see and when he gets there he's going to start looking for a bird. And then you wonder why I don't sit on the whistle at the end of the line. Because they're on the mark. They're not running the line. And you created that atmosphere right there. The other thing, the negative side effect of it is, if I want to teach them right there, good, is go ahead and be on this and, and, and hunt feathers and, and be a hunting dog and root it out, and then I run a blind and then I kick their butt for stopping and hunting a point because I didn't really want them to hunt a point, but I kind of talked them into doing it. And then you want them to believe you when you really need it. Not going to work. You're going you're gonna to send big signals. You're going to teach them not to really trust you. And you've got to be real consistent with this stuff. Is that, am I making sense with that part of it all? That's one of those unintended side effects of using marking style cues when you really don't want you're only, you're only trying to find an easier way to get them to go 40 yards straight. I'd rather have a poor initial line with the right attitude on a blind than any day of the week. Any day of the week. You're one whistle away from great blind every time. We'll get lots of hands popping up. Okay. So yesterday on the top line with Gamble, he did take a bad initial line. He started and then he went to the left and went around the bush that way. Right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think he really knew he was going back to the same line until he got far away out. Okay, because when you have a bad initial, like even though despite you were saying yesterday, don't be, don't use the negative, like I understood well, exactly you what you're saying. You kept using the lead, 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 lead. Yes, because I felt like he was head swinging. I felt mm -hmm. like he was like over here at that line. I really that. But then he's going to take that bad initial line. If you're, like what is it that you would use on a mark or a line that, because he had to go past the gun. The so one of the things we're going to do out here. Like, that's what I don't understand. One of the things we're going to do out here is the wagon wheel, because we have yeah. short grass. I didn't have short grass anywhere enough, like, yeah. where I could put people and not. But I said, aha. More of that. Got a place. So, the wagon, you know, in a wagon, I mean, the basic wagon wheel drill is typically eight white bumpers, right? Right. In a circle. Because I but thought then, I was thinking first. But then you do two tiers where you got eight red bumpers and the gaps with eight whites. And if you really go, you go 16 white bumpers in the gaps of those. So now you've got really fine. And so getting comfortable, working on what you just described, the dog looking around here, and I freeze them with the word sit. And in my world, sit means freeze, go for it. Just stop right where you are. Now, initially, it isn't going to, now, but if you have to use and you get them to think they see the stuffed animal underneath the sofa, kind of attitude. <laughs> In effort to get them to, you're not, you're not going to get comfortable telling them where we're going to go. You're going to be always asking them where to look. So it takes, it's a process of between wagon wheel drills, 
no no drills, land tune up drills, to get comfortable being a, and I'm not talking about being a hit worker or a mean person on that. I'm talking about being a firm leader for them to feel your conviction and say, all right, it's obvious. You're running the show here. Tell me what to do. And when they start buying in on that, what you're describing starts to get less and less. And I don't worry that much about what you describe. Everybody wants a, that dog that's a couple months, even, even a two and a half year old dog, to start acting like he's a six year old dog. To, to, you know, to, to all of a sudden get the idea and pictures on these magnum lines, and they're not going to do it. One of the best trainers I've ever been around, one of the best amateurs in sports I've ever seen, is a woman by the name of Judy Hancock. She was the first woman to ever win an Open National. And she was certainly a huge uh, influence in my world. And I remember a few years ago, I went down and did a workshop for her. Now I'm teaching the teacher. Because, and I remember her running a three and a half year old dog who had two all age wins. And she's running around with this dog in a blind. And she didn't work very hard for an initial line. And she sent somebody else and said, why didn't you try for this dog? This, this dog's not ready for it. I mean, this is probably one of the best amateurs this game has ever seen. And at a three and a half year old dog that's way more advanced than any dog that I saw here, she still said that dog wasn't ready for, for intense, fine initial line. She was, she was all about it. Let's get a reasonable look. Let's maintain the right attitude. And that's what a whistle enhancing is for. So I think you get impatient, and I don't mean you, it's me, yeah. us, with trying to expect these dogs to give you these great long initial lines. And like when you're doing these double blinds, and you're trying to convince the dog, well, we're not going right back to where we've been, you're kidding yourself. So what if they start going back? Half the time, on some of these lines, a great initial line is right towards where they just were. They just kind of stop and take a cast after that. And if you start to teach them, beat, that whistle means, no, we're going to do something other than what you're doing. And, they, and they're willing to do that. You, with, with reading momentum and a couple kindly casts, you can get, a, you can get perfectly acceptable and good, really good lines out of dogs that really didn't have a clue what they were about to do when they left. And you guys seem to think you want them to have, understand the whole manual <laughs> of that age, and they're not done. And that's okay. If they're just, and teaching them just to be okay with not knowing and not to get neurotic about like, the unknown, that's one of the biggest things we've got to do. Teach them what to do when they don't know what to do. Just lean on you a little bit. Sit on a whistle when you're told. Don't worry about it. The sky's not going to fall. And, you know, you're going to nurture them through it. And once they kind of trust you and believe in you, but once they, once you betray that trust, it's hard to turn around. So, so they take a good initial line, mm -hmm. but they get off the perfect line okay. with the young dog. You just let that dog carry it for a while for encouragement? Well, oftentimes, yes. I mean, I'm not going I'm to get to real to anal it. about it. Micromanaging. I mean, you know, certainly encouraging momentum and flow is important. Now, some people, in an effort to try to do what you just described, now tell me if you're hearing your questions. She said with a young dog, and I remind you to repeat the question so everybody can hear you. Uh, she said, on a young dog, do you let them roll if they're not online? Not online. Or do you? And I'm going to say, yes, I'm not going to manage a young dog blind like I would. Like Eric, I think he treats that dog more like what you're describing. And I think there's kind of, I said, I think he needs to try to do a little bit of the other thing, be a little bit more proactive and attacking some of the ones. But, but what some people end up doing with these young dogs, they've got a cross to the right to left. And in an effort to let them go, they let them fade. And they actually end up putting themselves in a much more challenging situation by not protecting the dog. Because now the cast you're trying to get because you let them roll is really hard to get and likely to end up in dog getting in trouble. And I'm trying to keep them from getting in trouble. 
That's how um, people say don't lie to your dog. But then the Well, side when I think of lying to your dog, there's two times I think of lying to your dog. False lining is one. That's when I point them there, and I really want them to go there because I'm trying to read all these factors. And the other one, and I do this to some degree, is but giving them this task when I really only want this. When you really, when you overpass. Now, there's times when you just have to do it to get through the line, like on that point over the next series, back to the hotel kind of thing. But I try as much as possible. My, if I were going to write a mantra on my hand, I said, I want to cast them or I want them to go, and I want to point them where I want them to go, as much as possible. I'll use other influences to try to give them information, but I'll, ideally, the, I work hard to try to put myself in a position to give literal casts. In other words, if it's 17 degrees of the blind, I'm going to do my best to give a 17 degree cast. If the bird is there, I'm going to try to point them there. Now, I may do things by working on their attitude, both in the field by sweating, both or on the line by sweating them or influencing them by stepping forward and stepping back to help me get to that spot. But I really, really, really almost never try to false line. That's what I think you want. Because the only way you get the dog eventually to be good about going where they're pointed is for you to consistently point them where you want them to go. And it may not work today. It may not work next week. But eventually, they'll get it. Eventually, they get in the habit of going where they're pointed. And trusting you. And trusting you. And it's just, I can't stress that enough. I know Daniel's got a question, but go ahead. So, if you're doing a drill where you send them one direction and stop them and cast them another way, that feels to me like you just, that you're tricking them. But why is that not the case? Well, because it's an exercise of changing direction. Now, if I set them in one place and Howard Noah called them back for going where I set them, that would have a problem. Okay. Okay? So, but the exercise of stopping and casting and going to different places is certainly an exercise I do. You do it on double T, you do it on pattern line casting drills where you're trying to teach a dog, where you have a dog that chronically doesn't want to change direction. Your dog is a beautiful casting dog. Beautiful casting dog. I mean, that dog is very trusting and, you know, and carries a cast. I mean, that's a lovely trick. And so you obviously taught the dog to change direction and go to different, de that plan B is, may happen and you may go to a different destination than you started on. So, um, but I don't think that's lying. I think it's only lying if you correct them for going or you scold them or do it, you know. And when I say correct, it isn't just power. Even knowing and calling them back, that's a correction. Absolutely. Daniel, I'm going to jump back. Well, I was thinking about what you said about cueing and easy, um, mm. And so I cue two birds. I cue the long retired with a watch it, and I cue the easy with an easy. Sometimes I'll say, look, if the middle bird's challenging. But to me, and what I'm thinking, and, and I don't understand how easy equals undisciplined. To me, easy is check down, hunt short, Why like way you, out. Because you went easy. Well, <laughs> well, easy. It does not mean it discipline. Easy means you're going where I send you, but it's going to be shorter than in relativity to the other birds out there. The way question. out, way out, when I cue the long, whether it be a retired or whatever, I cue way out, meaning you're going deep and don't you stop short and this is far. I couldn't say that yesterday. One thing, one thing I think you're missing. I think it's okay. more how you say it than what you're saying. Okay. I think you can say cheese right. or cheese bag. Yeah. I mean, I think it's the volume and the nature of how you say it more so than, than, the, than the word itself. Okay. I would so like I would use the more discipline, I would save the more discipline sentence for the longer bird. Now, let's get back to the easy bird because sometimes an easy bird has a lot of discipline. Right. Yeah, that's why I said, I said, well, I did a contradictory thing because I said easy, but I sent him firm because I was thinking he's going to get confused and do that stupid Does everybody thing. remember yesterday's test, last test we had? And I'm just, we have 
wire here. We had a retired gun here. And we had a retired gun. They were all retired. We're all like this, right? Like, you know, and I'm not going to draw the ditch. Okay? Right? We had a retired gun pinch with the wire. This was down in that little ditch. So, I'm, this is on Daniel's question. So, I'm going to talk about. Q A D he bird in a disciplined way. <laughs> are you, are you, does everybody follow me on this? Yeah. So let's pretend the order of the throws is one, two, three. Flyer first, right retired second. This bird third. And let's say the dogs that get this second can't come up with a short bird. Let's just pretend that that's, and a lot of times on a good short bird, that's the case. So you, you've decided that this bird here, you've got to get seven. All right? In order to do the test. There's been six dogs out of 35 that have got the test, and every one of them have got that bird second. So you decide, and that's called secondary selection. You've picked up the last bird down, you're selecting on the second bird retreat. This is this is classic and the most difficult secondary selection scenario you have, where you've got a juicy flyer sitting out there and a retired gun that's short of the bird. Okay? So if I was going to, well, I'm handling everything, I, 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 mind you, I'm going to give you, the only thing that's going to be different between hunt test and field test is I'm going to queue prior to this, to the, uh, the signal they got. But after that, everything would be identical. But I would come in and I would, when I hit the map the first time, I'd let them scan the field. Okay? Now, this gun's going to be visible and this one's going to be visible at the time that they're thrown. Let's pretend this is a protect. But I would pull them over to that right bird and I'd go right there, Mark, easy. Okay? Easy, right there. And I'd want them to kind of pump up. So, boom, this bird goes off. Boom, this bird goes off. This bird goes off. And I send and I get this bird. Dogs are coming back to me. He's right about, about here to you guys. That's when the first look begins. The dog's still coming toward me. I set my body up between the gun and the bird. Okay? So when the dog is right there, I want discipline from the beginning of this process. The beginning of the process is when they first come in. And I'm gonna and, and let's and let's say I'm running off the left, right? So can you picture this test, right? We just all look at it, and I'm looking at it, I'm the handler, and maybe I'm gonna do it from this side, because you're watching the line. And they come in with bird number three, and I go, here, sit, right there where the dog is about where the whiteboard is. I'm gonna take charge. I'm gonna be disciplined, because they have to be disciplined enough to be willing to go for this. But I've got to relax them before I sit. Discipline enough to go, relax enough to go. That's a lot of work. They have to be a discipline factor to it. But they also have to be, they can't just take a line. We saw the dogs that just went where they're pointed, went right through the ditch and just kept going. So they were, they just, they were disciplined enough to go, but not relaxed enough to look. So what I would do, I come in through right here, I go here. And their head maybe glance at the flyer, and I don't say leave it, I say here. Here is saying leave it for that. I'm telling them where to look, not where not to look, first of all. Here, and all of a sudden they, and I, they buy and maybe they look a little too far right, and they drift in, and I thought, okay, they're willing to go to the right. Here. Okay, do it right there. Easy, easy. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be my, but so the, the last set, 40% of the process is relaxed. The first part is the discipline. But if I go here, here, easy, easy. <laughs> that's you better not look at I've done with me. So I... They don't do short birds well when they're worried. Well, obviously you They don't do them when they're worried. They've got, so, but they don't go for them in that situation very well. 
if they're not worried enough to go over the corner. Now let's say, let's say I did try that, and a dog went shh, boom, and nailed the fly. I still have a good mark, right? But I got, how do I talk them back in? So I'm probably even more relaxed this time. I, I'm probably here. And I'm, now, they're, now I'm, just, I'm worried about them taking off behind and just lining through. You know, now I got a really good cheerleader. So I'll pull them in a little bit, but I'm still, I'm, and this is why I'm so angry, guys, about you guys taking the bird. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. It's too late. That first second, not even the second, tenth of a second, when they first turn around, there's two times it's critical. When the dog goes right here, okay, right here is the first time. First glances in the field, that's when they're their most pliable. They haven't made their mind up. Win the argument before the argument ever begins. Be aware of that first glance. And you can, and you know, and you gotta get good about that. Point your feet, getting it right, so when they come in, and this is why I want you guys to practice good healing mechanics. You guys, I mean, how do you guys shoot shotguns, right? Shoot bow and arrows? The only way you can direct that shotgun at that target is to mount it in the same place every time so it becomes part of your body. You know, any, any guy that teaches you, you sit in the house and you point at the exit sign, and you, and you, don't, you don't aim it, you just, and eventually it goes where you're looking. That's the same thing with the dog. If you need if you're in healing mechanics, are consistent. And you learn in an instinctual way, it's like throwing a baseball, shooting a basketball, shooting a shotgun, it's anything that you aren't aiming, you are instinctually directing. You have to be consistent with where you start, where your anchor point is, where you mount the shotgun, where you heal your dog. So if you're good enough, if you've done your homework and they go there and, and they heal properly, you come in and you point your feet and your body at the zone that you want to go to, then their spine comes in, and then you're so hyper aware, and they look, look, and, and so when they look away, you guide them either here or you step up and push a little bit. But once you get them where you want, and then the next time is the minute that bird comes out of their mouth. If it's water, they shake and they reacquaint. They'll, but that as soon as that bird comes out of their mouth, their first glance gives you so much information. And if you're like, if you're not even on present because you're worried about, like, what am I going to do with this bird? The, you watch the great animals. You know, they are going to be perfect about that. And they're going to do it so smoothly, you don't even realize they're doing it. So that is huge. I actually, let me see if I got this. So somebody from my line mechanics course, let me see if I can find this email. Really, um, it's a woman from California. Right to find her name was Wendy Wrong. Wendy trained by herself with toxers and wings, and she was really particular about the things I just described. And I got an email last weekend. Now, a few weeks ago, she had gotten an amateur second. It was like her first all these placement. And then she's up in Northern Oregon running <coughs> all of the West Coast professionals. And she wins the Open. And she's in tears. And she said, without a doubt, she said, that first look stuff that you preached to me, made every difference in the world. It was something I wasn't aware of, I didn't do. And she's obviously got a really good dog, and she's worked really hard, but she, I mean, that's, talk about Cinderella story, to go with the person that trains with mechanical throwers, like Danielle, and go and compete with people that have been getting, you know, the best grounds in the country, the best attention, the best trainers, the biggest setups, with flyers every other day, and to be able to compete, but you can do it too, because what the advantage you guys have is 
you've got that incredible rapport and understanding and relationship with your other. That sometimes can undermine it, but most of the time should enhance it. So by paying attention to details and good getting some of these fundamental things that aren't always the funnest things. They're, you know, because well, we all want to go out and play field trial, we'll play hunt test every day, have them. But it's not about the duck calls. It's about the mechanics, not about it's, it, it's, it's about the little things. And I, and I talk about in one of the books I really loved was called uh, Raising Your Game, Raise Your Game, I think it was. And it, it was an analogy, it was, a, it, was a, it was a book about working with actually business people. But this guy was a real sports fanatic. And he, was a, and he talked about his time with, he spent with Kobe Bryant, the, the great basketball player for the Lakers that died in that plane crash in the helicopter crash. And he said he went to a, uh, a basketball camp, and Kobe was going to practice. And he said, you might have to come and watch it. And at 3.30 in the morning, before this basketball camp, they showed him to the gym. And he said, for two hours, I watched Kobe do the most basic things you could imagine that you would think a sixth grader would be doing. And he did it over and over and over again. I thought he was going to be doing all the fancy stuff. He said, but what he did is he perfected the little things. He was a slave to the, the fundamentals. He said, it's, it's not the big things. It's the fact they do the little things better than anybody else. And, you know, and Rick, were you going to say something? you get finished. But no, that's really, and I just, and it isn't always what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. Go ahead, Rick. What you were saying about both blinding your dogs for the blind and setting them up for the next morning uh -huh. in your five circle thing that we did on blind or yeah five foot circle. Are we talking about the wagon wheel? No. Oh, the five foot circle. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're stepping up, like bring your dog in, whether it's for the blind, your dog's here. And to fight the factors or the factors of the rain, wind, yeah, everything. You, do you step up or back? Yeah, to control the dog. My, new, my neutral, neutral position is a like starting. You want point. that? You want to line him up exactly where he wants. You want him to go where he's supposed to go. Yeah, where the bird or the blind is. And to help those factors, are you stepping up and stepping back? Yes. Yeah. I'm creating, I'm giving them information. One of the things uh, in the course was the talking about uh, a marking drill we call the Ontario 10 step. It's where you throw a mark and then the gunner walks away and he draws the dog attention back towards the gun station or where it came from. And you can easily do it. That bird in the ditch on the right hand bird from a certain angle would be perfect. And if you had the gunner quite a ways down, It'd be hard to do with the cover of the trees because you couldn't walk the gunner away. But let's say the gun, let's just pretend there was a, a bush maybe 30, 20, well, 10 yards to the right of where you from. And he launched through the bird into the ditch and he walked back to the right and the dog followed him back and he sat the hole in the bush. Okay? Now you want to, now he's looking there but the bird's over here, right? Now the dog just saw the bird. Now that's an instance where I would, I, I'd be in the neutral position, which is my knee, his shoulder, which is, in a perfect world, the neutral position influences the dog to 12 o'clock, straight ahead. Now the dog, attention has been drawn to 130, let's say, because that's where the gun is. Now I need to influence him back to the bird. I'm going to step ahead of neutral. I'm not necessarily going to point his spine. Oftentimes when you move forward or back, you don't necessarily physically move the dog. You only shift his weight and his attitude. His weight might go from his right foot to his left foot. And a lot of times when you get, when the dog starts to really understand that information of the influence on the lion, it may not affect the lion which they take from off the map. But it oftentimes, when they get really good at it, it affects what they do in the last 20% of the retreat. They understand the bird's over here. Boom. 
Now, it's not some, it's only, and it's not something I handle or correct for, it's something I gently guide and teach them over time. So by stepping ahead of neutral or rear of neutral, I'm either pushing or pulling. I'm creating influence to the left by stepping forward, if he's on the left, and if I step back in neutral, I'm opening the door and encouraging the dog to pull a little bit to the right. But his spine oftentimes is pretty much in the same place, but his eyeballs, his weight, his attitude have shifted. So those are some of the subtle things. And, you, and when you do this wagon wheel drill, and the bumpers are so close together, you start practicing that influence. Like you're, you're trying to point at a red bumper between white bumpers, and, and their spine's pretty much, but you can tell they're thinking about the white bumper on the right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to step ahead. I'm going to put, and, and, and this is where I, I also vary my hand position. When I, when I put my hand down on a dog, it's typically right over the tip of his nose. But if I push it further forward and I, and I step forward, I influence the dog slightly left. If I draw it back, I influence to the right. And dogs will do that. I mean, I, I can bring a lot of dogs up here and just set them down. And if I, I step back, you'll see them look to the right. If I step forward, look. It, it's just a natural feel to have. Now, keeping these dogs aware of your presence and practicing that so they're hearing you and not ignoring you <coughs> is, is kind of an important thing. It's one reason when somebody asked, what, oh, didn't you ask about, um, uh, do I let the gun draw over it or do I, in between marks, or do I step back and then shoot then quiet? I step back and because I want them to really be dialed in to this means this, this means this. I'm, I have a whole dialogue going on without talking. Well, the only problem with that in hunt test is usually they um, knock and shoot before you have a chance to even move. So no. if you do that too often, they're going to know the difference between a hunt test and a... True. And they know the difference in field trial training, too. Because yeah. judges, just because judges signal fast doesn't mean I have to signal. Trick. No, I understand that, but I mean... So, I get it. And ideally, I would time it in such a manner. I, you know, and what I'm going to do, and I talk about pre-snap checklists, one of the pre-snap checklists is, is memorizing the judge's signaling cadence. Right. Mm -hmm. so Everybody usually, signals a little different. So, I know. I would prefer to be the one that moves to the next duck hall, or at least opens up or closes depending on whether the next thing that's about to happen is left or right or where he's looking. Right. Now, I just wanted to have enough time to see yeah. the mark and know where it yeah. is. Yeah, I want him to stare <laughs> into the ground as best I can. But how many, I mean, what is like, you guys judge, how do you have a routine? Like, when do you count one, two, before the next one? Do you, okay. or do you vary? Huh? I'm a four count. That's the bird hits. As a judge now? Yeah. Okay, so do you go one, two, three, four? Do you go one thousand, two thousand, three thousand? Well, I might have given so that's a pretty long count, right? If I was watching her, I, 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 and don't wait till you're in the holding line. I mean, if you're ten dogs down, start paying attention. Count. Okay, I know what she, she signaled so I could really keep this dog. Or wait a minute. And the hard thing is when you got a big swing. you got to swing from here to over here. It's not going to happen all the time, but it doesn't. Just because judges do certain things, I still want to do fundamentally good things that I think are going to enhance their their mechanics on the line. Right. <clears throat> Usually, I mix it up in training. I'll you know do the the I make the decision to churn and then signal for the okay. and then yeah. when I think the dog really has that down pat, then I'll mix the other in. So. You know, so, and I talked to you guys about taking notes. So one of my things that I really want to trace and keep track of is how well are they staying on the birds. If they're head swinging, I'm going to be writing down. Like, for example, that might be my diagram for my test. I'm going to, and, okay, that I have in my notebook. So I'm going to say, so I've got a little section, and if I've got more than one dog, I've got slated. What did I do with slate? So I did, in this instance, I did a double. 
and I want to know I did two, one, I did this double, and I did a single on number three. So, okay, so I saw the test. I can say slate on May the 14th or 13th or wherever, I did a double and a single. I know I did this and this. But I may write a little asterisk. Anytime I put an asterisk in the box, something I'm going to look at. Head swing. He's not watching the birds. What am I going to do? I'm going to say, if I see a bat, I'm like, wait a minute, he's really not watching the birds. I'm, going to, I'm not going to vary it. I'm going to say, we're going to do more singles. We're going to make him watch. We're going to count to five instead of two. We're really, you know, okay? So, you know, and I'm going to, you know, and, and I'm going to make, like, and the, my notations would be things like, um, you know, if I put a minus, it means something went wrong. If I put an H, it means I handle. And I may say handle R2. I may just say blue through. I just then I know he just went like this and he lined up here and I handled right here. Okay? Yeah, I may say minus handle, return to flyer. Oh, then I know it went like shoot, right back to the flyer. Then I'm gonna say, well, what did I do about it? I I, I handled times two, so I, I blew a couple whistles. And if I put a capital B like this, it means I made a harsh correction. I want to know if I handled, why I handled, and if I correct. If I do a small b, it means I net. Pat, we put copies of your notes lesson and a notes page oh, right. in your notebook. So the there you go. Perfect. So, so you see all of our short hands. Fantastic. Yeah. Because I think that and what most people do too much in their notes is they try to put too much information out. Yeah. I don't want to know what you have to practice. <laughs> right? I'm not trying to judge it like I'm judging a field trial. I'm not trying to judge a winner. But, and, I, and, and half the time, if it goes well, I just put a check mark. I just went good. Nothing notable. Things went smooth. If if it was a really hard test and they did great, I might put a little smile on the face. Say, wow. You know, really happy with that. I'm like, how often did that happen? <laughs> People get real excited when they look in their notebook and they come up and say, oh, I got a smiley face. So I just want to get the highlights. So, and so being able to trace patterns. And looking at notes from last spring, oh, yes. for example, I think one of the biggest things is when did we get the water? What? When did? What were some of the early water? I mean, if I had some of this popping and tending at the edge of the water, how long did it go on? What did I do about it? And when did it improve? So the things that worked in the past, you want to do it again, right? You want and and. You're not going to remember if you don't have some source to recall. You're going to want to know how, you know, and then you're going to want to analyze your tests. You're going to want to see, am I balanced? Am I doing too many short flyers? Am I doing too many long flyers? Am I doing too many, uh, you know, or am I mixing things up? Did I theme things well? Did I do two or three tests similar and then move on, which is what I like to do? You know, I'd like to just kind of repeat the same concept for a while. I don't necessarily do that in workshops as much uh, because I want to show you a variety of things. So when you say but, a while, you mean like two or three days? Yeah. So you don't do that same concept? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like if we, you know, early in the winter when we're doing like all land work and we're not in the water, we may do the same, we may move into the same test a couple, three different times, you know. That and I may make it easier depending on the previous success rate, or I may make it more challenging. I may write it out and do like the mama hopper. That's a classic thing that also dogs get, you know, that some dogs just have a super hard time doing. So, and a lot of those, some of those kinds of tests, short birds in general, and mama papa 
has got a short bird feel to it usually. They usually are afraid to go in and they go long and they go somewhere else. And short birds, they, the, the more they fail, the worse they end up doing it. So you need to kind of ease up and get them believing in themselves. Sometimes long discipline birds are enhanced more by being more disciplined and sometimes getting corrected enhances their ability to do it. Short birds is almost the opposite. So, uh, a question pertaining to my dog and yesterday, okay? okay. So, um, I know that we need to work on the sit. Obviously, we're going to work on the force to pile. To help with the compliance, is that where you recommend the wagon wheel tune-up drill? I think, you know, wagon wheels are okay, so right. I mean, it's, okay. I think one of the most important things is the ability to rotate a dog in a clockwise and counterclockwise easily and accurately. And a big part of it is, Danielle, is practicing your work. Oh, I did. You know, in other words, like when I'm going to rotate a dog from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock, do I do this? Do I do this? Or what I do, and I'm real particular about it, and I'm not going to, if I'm going to, if I, if I want to turn a dog from dead here to there, I put this foot back like this, I rotate, I draw, and I just, I do. This is the move, and the dog is here, and when I say here, all I want the dog to do is just pivot on his butt. So, and you think it feels like such a simple move, but I'm telling you, even some of the, my best amateur handlers, they just struggle with that. Getting a dog to move like this, they'll go like this, they'll go heel here, here, and the dog will like, you know, all confused about what goes on, and half the time, the dog just moves laterally, but never changes the direction he's, he's focused on. He only moves to the right. You're trying to get him, so getting a dog practicing, rotating, like this. So, I tell you, Danny Farmer did this. He told me he had a knee replacement. He couldn't run the dog. And he was watching the amateurs and he goes, pulling his hair out because he's, half of that when he's running dogs, he's not paying attention as much, but he was really watching. And he said, they can't, they can't rotate. They can't do it. So he put a, a mat in three different holding blinds. And everybody, when they got in the holding blind, they had to do two rotations a 360 healing drill before they ran. It's not a bad little exercise. You know, practice the ability to go clockwise, counterclockwise, and if you're two-sided, pull and push, and get it up. And ideally, it's, I say it's almost like basketball. Their butt is their pivot foot. If they're getting up and doing this, they're trying, they're, it's not good. I want them, for the most part, to do that rotation, because how many times when you step forward try to influence, the dog just steps ahead of you again. Mm -hmm. Or you try to pull and he jumps ahead of you. Now you're pulling him back and then you're pulling him over and there's four moves to get that much movement. The smoother and more seamless that little movement can be, the, the, better, the better you're going to do. Oh. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Because your dog's right there. Here goes. That I get them oftentimes too. Pull their butt around. There I actually get them to move. If I'm here and I want to go from here to here, I'll go like this, and the dog and I'll say here. And, and they and the dog will go. This is the move I want them to make there. Now, the here move is I want them to go like this. So really that's the two motions, right? Go to the right or go to the left. Going to the right, I, I, I want to teach the dog to do this. Going to the left, I want to teach them to do this. And it, you probably can do it, especially with a lot of you folks with obedience, you could probably do this with your eyes closed, but now all of a sudden you start blowing duck calls and shooting birds, and my once pretty well behaved dog, not so good. How about plus you want to keep that phone down, where yeah. I'll tend to know they can get up there. Right. Yeah. The biggest thing I want most of, the reason I talk about keeping the phone down, is because when you go here, and they jump ahead of you, and now, the dog is there. You're no longer the influence you want to be. Great. And you try to influence them to the right. Now, now the dog is, has done this and jumped ahead. Now what do I do? Do I just go with that? And if I reheal on my back where I try to heal off of, 
Or do I step up to them and now they're, next thing you know, we got the chest beat force stretch and handler again. His bad behavior is modifying you and now before you know it, the line's back there but you're up here because you couldn't get him to pull. Um, so that's one of those little footwork things that takes a lot of time. And it is so important. And it is so valuable. And the better you get it, the more successful you're going to be. And the less effort you have to put into it, and the less argument you have to do, the less you're going to get inside their head. And their focus is only about where the next word is, not about the argument that's ensuing on the map. Because if your dog is kind of new, you don't want anything to distract them if you can help it. I said it's like texting and driving. There's a real one. There's a reason it's, it's illegal, because it distracts you. If you're doing all this and the whole argument is that the dog won't move, and you're now it becomes an aggravated obedience drill instead of like where's the middle retired gun? Now he's completely forgot it because it's, you you argued about this. So the more you can make that as smooth and routine as possible. And then when good behavior becomes the habit, it's not a discipline thing, it's just what they do. So I've worked really hard with that with Ty, and I see it with him, compared to, say, Bodhi, where there was a little bit of more leniency right. due to lack of knowledge of things. Um, where Bo's, or Tycho is very good at it, right there. Right. Which, you know, and there's a, there's a fine, I mean, there, there's a balance here. I mean, this isn't just a dog being a robot. I mean, I'm not necessarily encouraging that. I'm telling you, and, I, and, and you know, I want, you know, what I said is the things that aggravate you about some of these dogs that are kind of high power are really what makes them so good. That stubbornness can be turned into a precocious, courageous, high persevering dog that won't give up when you don't want it to give up. But if you don't manage it, then it becomes a dog that won't work with you. And so just knowing how aggressive to be with some dogs about this and how encouraging you need to be with others, there's the art of this whole thing. You know, I'm talking about the science, but there's, you know, just having that instinct of like, all right, how demanding do I want to be? And how, uh, but, or how lenient you all want to be to encourage a more relaxed state. And that's, that's good, right? And so then, you know, and then your test design, you're looking at your notes and seeing what your success rates. Do I, I know I want to do a triple, but I need to do singles. I want to do singles in the friendliest fashion, and I want to kind of get some momentum going before I start to be challenged. All important things. Yeah, I was just thinking about that, and I mean, wouldn't like a little place for it be helpful? Oh, absolutely. Because that teaches absolutely. them where they have to stay. They can't move forward or back. Mm. What's the five-sided place for it? You ever seen those that somebody used? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, some some folks were making them, and they were rep and they were really good, and it really got you to practice, and it really gave the dog an insight into developing that pattern of staying. You know, there's one reason people use mats because it gives them, identifies a zone that they want to work in. But they could still yes, move right. off a mat. They oh, true. Really sport, true. I would think. Because there's a yeah. there's a lip, and the dog realizes when he's not on it, he can feel it with his feet. Uh, I'm perfectly good with that, and I think it's a great starting point. You know, but at some point, you know, you wean yourself off of that to the point where they do it without even a reference. But that's I think that's most of it. Rick, did you have something like that? Yes. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen a dog do this, but I heard him talk about it on the, the video. Right. I think it was the first symposium from Farmer and Lurie. Okay. About the spin. I don't okay. Know. What it is, what is actually a spin, mm -hmm. what causes it, and how can you correct it if you have it. You know, it, and. And I say, I think in one, there's probably three things that scare me the most. And crying noise, spinning, and freezing on birds. Those are some of the three deal breakers. But spinning is all, all virtually always caused by some sort of pressure or perceived pressure from the dog. And, and it's, it's a variation of a pop. It's a pop with 
oh, I can't pop, I gotta keep going, kind of thing. And I've been around, and, and, and when I say perceived pressure, some of the good dogs that I've been around that developed spinning, there was no way to trace it back to a bad correction or, or poorly timed. Uh, but, and some of these dogs did it on the flyers, on the motor, and the pressure was really just the excitement of the atmosphere. But a spin is where they go and they, and, and they twirl a circle. Was it from handling? You stop them on the whistle and wow. they, they turn to your right, their left. Yeah. To sit and you give them. You know, you'll see some dogs that are almost prone to, to spinning out of excitement. Ever see the dog that jumps out of the truck and starts spinning in circles? I, I mean, they're kind of almost programmed to do that sometimes. You know, it feels like. So at some point, it becomes a little bit of a pattern that they, that they rely on that. So that, now, not that you're going to tell them not to do that, I mean, or maybe you would, I suppose. Um, when I've worked on spinning problems, um, most of the time, we have, the thing that has worked the most is that we stop them on a whistle in the act of spinning. So, and then cast them with light, with some degree of force, in the, uh, in the direction that they spun from. So if the dog turns to his right and is starting the act of spinning, I would stop the spin and then I would give them a right hand cast so it would unwound them and then it might be a back neck back then. And now I'm telling you, when you see the spinning thing, I mean, we always go back to reviewing force on back and we do a lot of the force on back from a remote seated position, so there, so I really, I really perfect the understanding of being forced at a distance with the dog looking at you, so that when I do it at, at the distance that it, that is likely to occur, I, I have a pretty good idea that it's going to uh, that it's going to go smoothly. Now, with that all being said, you know, you think like, well, wait a minute, pressure caused it. How is pressure going to cure it? Um, it's probably misunderstood pressure. Now, and it's probably a combination of teaching them not to respond that way when they're anxious, and then easing up your test so they're more relaxed and they're less anxious on top of, on top of it. But it is one of those, and sometimes it happens right in front of you, sometimes it happens right, the hardest ones where it happens right near the bird on a mark. Like within 40, 30 yards of the bird, you can't. Some dogs actually do this and they spin in their hunt pattern. And it's not a rock, but it's almost, a, you know. So the dogs that you know have a tendency to spin, and the further out it happens, the harder it is to manage. If it happens 10 feet off line, you can, but when it happens, it catches you off guard, and it's, you know, at a distance, it can be very tricky. So um, it's one of those uh, it's one of those things that the first time you see it, you go, wait a minute, time out, what's going on here? And I, you know, may go back and review some things. And I will also, and when a dog spins on a mark, and when that, and a lot of times, and I, and some of the most recent spinners, you would think would spin on a blind, the thing that they should be the most anxious about, but. The two dogs I, they came to mind, and they were actually literates. Spun on marks in that one. And um, so when we redid force, we had to do it in the context of mark. We would mark the pile and force and root to that pile that was thrown. And then, you know, so we had to kind of, like, all right, we weren't just forcing on a back set. We were forcing on vital. And then back and then back and group, or we may even set them down, throw a mark behind them, and force them off back off of a throw. I mean, something that was going to resemble the situation that was likely to be encountered, so that when I used the correction sequence that I, we decided to use, it was the the understanding was perfected before I ever tried to use it in the field. 
And I encourage you to do that with any problem. That's why we go back and we want to. That's why I want to take the retrieve out of him sitting on a whistle with pressure when he wants to come in and show him that coming in doesn't alleviate the pressure. Putting him and it, and that's what's hard. When he's coming in, you can't stop him unless you've got somebody with a lead or you've got a tie to pitch post or something like that, and you can teach him to sit when he wants to come home. I see somebody has uh, there some, any hand questions with one real quick. Go ahead. Well, I, just to keep on the, the track you just started. So you said that to you the three kind of big problems were spinning, vocal, and freezing. Um, freezing. Mm -hmm. Can you address the other two quickly? Just you know, freezing takes a lot of different, and again, sometimes freezing is pressure. Sometimes freezing is just a dominant dog saying, I, I, this is my bird, you can't have it. Um, sometimes freezing is, I'm not letting another dog get my bird. Sometimes it's just absolute eyes rolled back. I'm so mesmerized, excited, the right drawing, nobody's home. In a different world, and they don't even know what they're doing, kind of freezing. Now, the first time I see a dog starting to get sticky, grabbing the birds, where you got to say drop a few times. I will go into what we call a force drop routine. Okay, and, and I have done this successfully with dogs, and, and when you first see it occur, and I, and I did this with, one of the cases I remember was a six and a half year old field champion that came from the Northeast, and a big, beautiful male, and I didn't train him before, and he was trained very well, and he was very successful, and all of a sudden he started freezing. And I went back, just like we did with uh, uh, Kevin's uh, uh, Ruby. Not Ruby, no, 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 no. And I started a reforce fetch. And I emphasized three fetch, hold, and drop. Or, you know, I'm just going to use those words if you say leave it or give or whatever, I don't care. But you know what I mean. Fetch means to grab it. Hold means to hold it and not drop it. And drop means to inject it. Now the force drop part of that whole thing is I have to teach them actually to spit it out. Not just let me take it. Now, and I emphasize the word teach because when you, most of us when we've done force fetch and they, they, they spit it out, you correct them for spitting it out and you make them pick it up. So if they've been, most, a lot of dogs don't want to spit it out because they think they're going to get in trouble for spitting it out. So you have to kind of nurture it through that process, you know, and I grab the cord a little bit, just enough, I don't put any pressure on it, and I teach them to eject it, okay? And eventually, I want to get them to the point where I can stop them where Danielle is and say, drop it, and spit it out. Well, you know how I did that is I always used to freeze on birds when he was sort of middle-aged. Never as a puppy, never as a young dog, but middle-aged once he started getting happy, and Sean and I worked on that for probably two years, with two summers with him. And Sean said, first, give him some indirect pressure on sit, and then slow down. Like, you are trying to take the bird so quickly yeah. from him, and you're not, your timing of drop is not, like, he's still in the hold sequence. Do we have a book for anyone? Go ahead. Keep and talking. so I was holding on, I just, sit and hold and I wait a minute and slow down my cadence and then he knows okay drops coming next I need to spit because all he was bad at that years ago but you know again good now. you know whether you're dealing with freezing on a cast or the first time that they uh, uh, freeze you know if you try to deal with it right there on the spot you know in your right pressure by the time you say sit with the neck and then you say drop and the sit with the neck puts them on guard and says, oh, I better behave. And you say, drop, and they spit it out. That's fine. But if you if you want to deal with it directly, in other words, if you want to be able to say, drop, with a correction, then you have to do some groundwork to, to make it. Because if you, once again, if you say, drop, and they don't drop, and the pressure goes away, you're simply reinforced to not drop. You're, all right? Because if you say, drop, and they don't drop, the pressure goes away, well, they've relieved the pressure by that drop. 
So you, that's what the risky part of using direct pressure is. Okay. But that's so when I, and if I have a cord on this, are you? Do you want more of the cord? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, brother. I mean, this is a great book. <laughs>
I, mean, I, I would, uh, I mean, I would correct in some way, shape, or form, and and it may, I may, I may even grab and pinch their lip and get them to. I mean, that that's my first instinct. Okay. Now, if I've got a dying the whole, you know, hard time freezer, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to think about that. But I mean, I, you know, at some point, you try a lot of different things, and something that doesn't make sense ends up actually working. But that wouldn't be my first instinct. So then you just don't do marks until. You get yeah, that. or I wouldn't use birds, or I would do, you know, some other things. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but so, yeah. So, um, my dog, he'll get up there. He doesn't really shop like on bumpers and stuff, but when he goes for birds, he kind of ups around with it, you know, like, and doesn't want to, you know, it, it takes him a while to pick it up and then start back, and then sometimes he'll drop it to rearrange and come back. I mean, is that just a whole problem? Well, I mean, I, I like to... And, you know, and part of it is when I force fetch, I'll force fetch and work on it with the bird as well as the bumper. And I don't mind even doing pile work with birds. Uh, and then I'm pretty particular about not chopping. There's a lot, of, and I think that's one reason I, uh, I address shopping, because I want to create structure to not just going, but the whole process of pile work isn't complete until, the retreat, until I, he's delivered the retreat. So I want just as much structure about picking it up. And, and a lot of times, when they start playing with it, they'll slow down and stop or get ready to drop it. Then I may correct up here because they're not coming. So, like, because if there's just one bird there and he goes and he picks up, you know, and that's just the one bird, he's not shopping it, he's just messing with it. And, and, he, and he doesn't hurt the bird at all. He okay. just eventually picks it up and comes. But so does it, is this like when you throw up, he'll stand over the bird? So did you see he what? Stop. He, huh? he goes and you can see he's. I don't know if yeah, but, but, but what you're describing right there is the dog has not picked it up and started coming in. Right, right. Yes. So did you see what I was doing with the dog with the six foot lead? And I gave him. He had as soon as he like one tenth of a second, I gave him a chance to grab the bumper and I yanked him away. If he came away without it, I fetched with him in. And I get him to come in, and that's why shopping dealing with shopping is so valuable because you create that. Yes, sir, pick it up and come home. They don't pick it up and go for a victory lap. They don't, they don't sit there and like, squeeze this one because that's the beginning of what you just described. Okay. So that's why I think there's, there's merit in, in addressing that. And I address it initially with a six-foot lead and fetch to the pot. And I've got a pile of bumpers and I go in and I, and I don't rip their head off but I give them a little pop. I give them a reasonable amount of time to grab, to grab a bumper. But when I give them a pop and they go, oh, I guess I don't know. And I make, then what I'll do a lot of times is I take the one bumper out of the pot and I go fetch with a correction and I pop. And they'll get, you'll see them go in and, and say, I better get this on the first go around. And then they'll sit to it into attention. And then I say, good dog, that's what I want. And you'll see them say, oh, okay, I got it. I, I understand what the rules are. And I really want to show them what it is, but I want to make it clear that that's the way we need to do it all the time. So that's what I would go back to. And because if you just out of the blue start burning that dog at the bird to come in, so there's a lot of misinterpreted concept side effects to that. But if I've already prepared them for it by addressing it with a pile of bumpers in the yard, that there may be some pressure involved with you having to come back with that bumper that I told you to fetch, and you understand it, and you've already worked out the side of it. When you address it in the field, it's not the first time. But if you wait till it's a full-blown habit, and you all of a sudden say, well, we got to correct it, and you burn him at the bird, and he jumps away from the bird, now he's weird about the bird. Sure, that's going to happen, because you didn't do your homework. So, zero. Yeah. Your, third, your third thing was noise, almost. Yeah. Noise. Oh, yeah. I, it's, now, I mean, the last module that I did, and actually the last <laughs> implementation call that I had in our, in our course, the whole thing, almost the whole thing was talking about noise. And there's no, there, I mean, there's, noise takes on a lot of different things. You know, noise when they're in the holy wine, wine. 
Barking when the birds are going off or making noise. Barking on scent. Barking on a whistle. Making noise on a cat. I mean, there's all of those different things. Um, some of which are easier to address than others. Sometimes, initially, noise goes along with some other undisciplined behavior, creeping, moving around. So sometimes if you just add discipline to healing and sitting and not moving, you bring them down a notch and the noise may go away. But in the instance of just noise, there, I mean, we can spend a couple hours talking about every variation of that. One of which is addressing noise away from the tree and teaching them that. Um, one of the most challenging is that bark on scent. Now, I, I did a workshop, a, a one-day deal from Karina with Jim Van Egan. It's one of the best basics for him. And what he'll do is he'll have, I talked about that horse lunge line, that 3 8 inch kind of soft rope. He'll have one of those, and he'll have it loose in his hand. And, and he has a dog that he knows maybe might go whoop on scent. Well, he stands, and if they do it, he stops and jerks them back, quiet, no, and he treats it then like a steady disturbance. They don't rethrow. And if he makes noise, he doesn't he corrects them, doesn't let them get it. And then he may de-escalate the excitement. And then when he goes, and eventually, one of the hardest things about noise is sometimes dogs do it without knowing they're doing it. That's what I was just gonna say. You gotta be able to communicate to them what it is you're correcting them for. Because that sin, and then and then what sometimes happens that really makes you want to pull your hair out is you get the dog that you send him and he barks and comes back on his own. <laughs> and now, now you got a dog, right? now you got a dog and a recast, no. So it's tricky, very tricky. And, you know, if we really wanted to dive into it, but I tell you, I mean, but I think I use, as much as anything, the, the formulation of a steadiness drill where you correct and either retrieve, try to show the better behavior, and one of the other things is, if it's all about excitement, bear down a little bit on the, on the manners and try to shoot a lot of birds and keep them in an exciting atmosphere and saturate them with the experience. One of the wildest dogs I ever ran finished a couple national championships and almost won one. And you could barely get him through a weekend trial. And we overwhelmed him with just pure work volume. In, ten, in, in about 10 days, part of pre-national and the national, we did 67 series with that dog. 67 times that dog did. Didn't get corrected on everything. We just, we worked and worked at secondary selection. We did everything at rules, complicated. He got corrected some. But it wasn't just, be, you know, the beat him up thing just it wasn't working and, and we weren't going to do it. And it wasn't, you know, it, it, it didn't work at the moment. Sometimes but, it just escalates it. Sometimes it escalates it. Yeah. Absolutely. A lot of times it escalates. So it, it is, and that's the reason it's one of those super complicated things. And, uh, you know, whether, and so, some dogs bark out of anticipation or excitement or anticipation and pressure. Some dogs bark out of just, just excitement. Some dogs just do it because they're a noisy dog. But, you know, each case has to be kind of broken down individually and addressed in other areas. Now, Connie Cleveland and Pat Nolan are, you know, Connie's a big obedience trainer and Pat's a, uh, uh, and they're just wonderful dog people. And Connie had sometimes taught dogs to bark and speak and then taught them to be quiet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've never done it, but I thought, mm, that's an interesting approach. I've done Some people that dogs lay down on whistles, they teach them to lay down, they teach them to sit up. Down, Nick, sit, you know, so they actually, so there's some ways to do that, but wow, it's a, it's a biggie. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I want to give you some positive reinforcement. I need it. <laughs> okay. Uh, I didn't get an answer in one day. And for drills, uh, for working on building memory. I tell you, one of the drills that I like um, is, for example, land tuna drill. Now, you don't think that. They think, of, why is that build memory? Well, when you have like seven line retrieves that are so complex and have got so many factors in them, and you do them over the course of the day, when they start to kind of comprehend and not just remember the line, but remember all the things associated with those lines, it really stimulates memory. I think, compl I think complicated drills, uh, some, even wagon wheel casting drills, uh, that you know, straight back, right angle, straight back, things that require them to really concentrate. I think memory, a big part of memory is, is, is maintaining concentration for a longer period of time. Yeah. So drills that go on for an extended period of time that force a dog to stay engaged and stay self-discipline is a part of it. Now, get, getting a dog, and, and, and sometimes, you know, doing more complicated tests and then helping them through it, even when they don't remember, start to make them not be afraid of, you know. I think that, and, and doing things that are pretty challenging, but not making them get in trouble all the time when they don't deal with the challenge well, and make them not afraid to be a little uncertain, helps build the confidence that they can remember. Now, I think what happens, what scares us with the memory thing, is the dog that, doesn't remember, then gets in trouble for doing something that he's really not obvious or sure about what he's done. And then they become nervous and anxious. And when they, anytime they're a little bit unclear, then they start worrying and you get all that kind of crazy behavior. Well, that's what I'm worried about with Slate. I can only do single, you know, I keep going back to singles, but it's like there has to come a time where I have to push him and challenge him without making, setting him up for failure. But I also have to balance some of his wimpiness, I guess. Right. Um, when it comes to those dogs that every time you kind of extend them outside of their comfort zone, they kind of fall apart. It's, it's really how you man, and, and, and I said to you, you know, when I listened to you and Doug talk a little bit, I think, you know, Doug's come from a little bit of an area where he's a little bit quick to jump to pressure, to crush it. And I think that's the biggest problem. I think you cannot, you do not correct dogs for making mistakes. No, I, no, I, you I agree. You, got, you correct them yeah. for lack of effort on things that they understand what the rules are. Yeah, exactly. True, exactly. So right. when you, and it's easy, and, and it's, it sounds so obvious, but identifying what's a mistake and what is lack of effort is tough. Yeah. Really tough. So when in doubt, clarify what it is you want. Correct for not complying. And first whistle corrections are dangerous. They're, they come with huge warning labels. That's that may cause vomiting and diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, and you know, and, and what I mean by that is uh, a dog starts to return to the old fall, or a dog starts to cheat. There's nothing wrong with stopping and saying, "Don't do that," and giving them a cast, and then correcting them if they don't cast. But burning on the first whistle. And assuming they understand what they just did is a, is, is a slippery slope. But with the exception of Link's galloping that he has now a habit we're trying to work right. on, that's where I err on the side of, you know what, you're going to change direction. And right. And you know, you're going to, you know, you're in close, you know what's understood, you give them a cast, you give them, and then maybe you give, make sure you give a real clear cast. You Kind of feel it. He's not really in compliant mode, and you may correct on the first cast if you don't. I get, it, but I'm just saying if you just err on the side of uh, when in doubt, leave, leave the correction out. You're gonna, you're gonna be safe. Now, it does. I'm not telling you to reduce your standards. No, I, I. And I'm not telling you to, to let them do bad things. But I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with telling them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them again, and then tell them again, and then correcting after you've made 
just make sure. Don't assume you, they know what it is that they just did. And, you know, it, the newer you are, the more like you are to say, well, he knows exactly what he's doing. Well, don't assume that. That can get you in trouble. Yes? Could you please, because I want to write it down, could you please go over again whenever people are doing blinds, like you were saying, maybe if the wind direction is a crosswind, you go, you, you cast with this arm, or, okay, you know, when you cast, you know, which, which cast you give with wind and stuff. You know? When you go straight across, when it says the table cast. Right. Let's just... This is our line. We've got a strong crosswind blowing down. Is that pretty... Everybody got to understand that right there? We've got a landline. Wind blowing this way. You know, we can enhance this with all kinds of other factors. We can enhance it with a poison bird over here. Or a dry shot or a diversion, or a previous set of marks. But the wind's blowing this way, and most dogs are going to want to fade with the wind. They're going to let this wind push them almost like current wood in a river, for example. So this is the perfect line. So the red line is us Maybe the dog we just sent, he starts like this. I guess this is good. Or rock. And the dog starts to fade. And you stop him here. Your first decision is, all right, he's not that far off line. He's pretty, but his momentum has shifted that way. When we're trying to go that way. So right here you get a decision to make. The wind's blowing this way, he's started to fade. You've watched enough dogs. And the dogs have chronically scalped over here and maybe got the line from here. And didn't think it was very good. You don't want to do that. So you stop here. My first cast, typically, because it's into the wind, is going to be a literal silent cast. Literal is going to be B, maybe like that. Okay? One of two things is going to happen. One of three things. He's but let's pretend the dog goes like this and scalps again. And you stop. Now, in a perfect world, you don't wait till they've gotten here. You stop them right here, right when the momentum shifts. But let's say you have, and you think, well, is he taking it? Is he taking it? And you blow it. Boom. And now you're a little more offline. So. One question. So go the ahead. Literal, the literal silent cast, is that with your left arm then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because he's up, yeah. Yeah, because right. he's, yeah. he's on the right side of the line, yeah, so you're going and I'm giving this cast, okay? And I say it's fairly literal. Maybe literal would have taken him right there, but so. But let's say you stop again and you give a left angle back because uh oh, this crosswind's starting to get developed, and I better, I've got to change this pattern. And wow, all of a sudden he takes the cast beautifully. But Is wait a minute, now he's also? on the left side of the line. I've gone probably the. Those two, here's what would have likely happened with the, the X's is where it blew the whistle. B, first one, I went literal. He went a little bit, curled again. B, he's a little bit more offline. I'm going like, hmm, I could be in trouble here if I don't get a direction to change it. This dog doesn't throw a towel in. This could be able to, I'm going, I'm going back, I'm out of this field trouble. So I go like this. I gave him a field trouble, bigger cast. I sweat him maybe a little bit. I stare him down. I count to five and not, not just two. And all of a sudden, I heighten his concern level. And I blew that second whistle. Bing! That's that mean, you better pay attention whistle. And I felt, they felt a little chill with the whistle and they stopped a little different. And they know, like, I'm not putting up with your crap today. And they go, oh, okay. So they give me the test. And now I'm on the upwind side of the line. Hmm. What do I do here? That's why I use voice. Because the wind, if I go, now, if I all of a sudden got the dog, now, I'm not saying that he understood that it's a crosswind, 
at this point. Maybe he just understood, I better change direction. So I've got a decision to make. What cast is going to get me here? A lot of you guys yesterday went with another side. Now, if I've already started to establish the left-right shift momentum, a silent cast is probably going to put me right back over here. Now I'm right back in the same boat I was in. But maybe that right verbal back. So my three, my first, let's pretend, more than likely, if you showed me that, my first cast was this, my second cast was this, my third cast was that, a right hand verbal back. Because what does the verbal back do? It de-emphasizes changing direction laterally and emphasizes going rearward. So this is the gas pedal. So that verbal back will spin them like this. The wind will kind of start to carry them. And I probably blow right here again. And I go with this. Now if I now if I kind of felt like I've all of a sudden reestablished control of this dog. This dog is now, I can tell by his body language that he's kind of bought in and he says, okay, I get it. You're running the show. Then I go maybe literal again. And I stop and I cast like this. And maybe he drifts again. And I do this. And that's a pretty good blind. So Especially when the other dogs went like this, went like this, went like this, went like this, and the guy goes over and then they're over here, and then they win the blind from there. So, pretty easy to tell which one you like and which one you don't. What were the first two casts that you gave? Were they silent? Yeah, I mean, at this point, I've stopped them just as they crossed the line of the blind. And some judges are real particular about you, you know, now, not doing this. <laughs> they want you to challenge that. <laughs> or whatever, I'm just seeing you. So, you know, so they like to see you pretty much stay in that corridor. So, but at this point, I realize I've seen enough of these blinds to know that if I get over in here, I'm in trouble. I, you know, dogs aren't taking that cast, so I'm not going to let myself get there. I'm going to be real proactive in the minute. That right shoulder drops, and I, and I feel them starting to give in to the factor of the wind, I blow right away. And what that whistle says, no, stop what you're doing. Don't even think about it. And now I've really kind of regained the upper hand. And every time they drift back downwind, I stop again. Not just because they're offline, but because they're starting to give in to the factor. And they start to understand why I move. You know, when you blow, and, and so many people said, what cast do you give? Probably more importantly is when did you blow the whistle? Did you give them the feedback and information at the time they started to think to give in or go for the poison bird or start to cheat or start to do whatever? And you were on it. And they almost think you're reading their mind. And now, you really not only, and it isn't that you're more, that you're necessarily more, a stronger whistle and more aggressive. You're just more proactive. And they really, you're, stop, you're stopping some of that negative behavior that's starting to bud early in the process. And you can, that's where you, a good handler, can really get to a blind. Where maybe you guys are hoping, like, ah, that's not so bad, that's not so bad. Maybe I need to blow, boom, you're over here. And then, so you go like this, and you go, ah, boom, and then you're over here. But if you, but so often, the best places to blow these whistles are right here, right when the momentum just starts to shift. Right when they, and that's where, that's right when they started to give in to the fact. Pat, you mentioned the one cast de-emphasized. A oh, directional change. Yes, can you explain that's that? That's the me? verbal back. That's, because what happened here is I gave a silent cast and they didn't change direction. They just kept going back to this direction. Now I sweated them, blew a meter whistle, I waited a little longer, and I gave an angle back, let's say, and all of a sudden the dog said, oh yeah, okay, you're in charge. But now I'm saying this dog is, in, is, is really sensitive to my directional change casting, because if he yielded that much into the wind, I know with the wind he's going to yield even more. And I don't want him to yield more, I want him to go back, right? So uh, the risk of going silent here is you give a literal cast, but you get almost a right over. And that's where that ping pong starts. And sometimes when you get into ping pong, you can't get out of the ping pong. They end up going left, 
right, left, right, left, right. You're trying to get back here. And by the time they've done it two or three times, all your rearward momentum has been killed, and you can't get it back, even when you holler back. So I get this cast, and this, I'm right here. I'm a little bit upwind. I can't really drift over there because I'm not doing the blind anymore, and the judge isn't going to like it. I want to bump them over, but I don't want to reestablish 2 o'clock momentum, so I go back. And a lot of times, and I say, you notice how I said back and gave the cast, so it hit up almost simultaneously. And what that should do is that should take that dog and spin him like this. If I go give the angle and then the back, a lot of times you don't get this. If I, but if I give that back early, it emphasizes the primary influence on that cast is to go away from me. And then the wind now becomes my friend and not my enemy because the wind helps them change direction. And then that's where you get this and bingo, they're kind of online. And just as they start to give in, I stop again and I remind them, no, we're gonna, we're gonna fight that crosswind again. And now I've got a pretty compliant finish. So, but if I do this, and I go, and I'm always side the cast, and I'm back over here, I'm not sure I can reestablish that momentum again into the wind. Maybe I've, all, I've opened the doors to caving into the wind. Now he takes the cast, and he's going what's comfortable because the wind's at his back and he's going like this. And he kind of likes being over there. And now you can't, and the further away they get, the harder it is to get them into the cast into the wind. So those last casts that were getting pushed for, those are silent? Yep. Pretty more literal. Yeah. When do you give a verbal back with no hand signals? Um, a no hands back, I mean, if you ask Larry, he's saying you never give that. But I do give it. Now, where you want virtually no directional change, and if it isn't that critical which way they turn. Now, it is somewhat predictable, because dogs will typically spin opposite of the previously given cast. So if I've given this, and they're pretty much with me, and I stop, and they're right on line, and I got a tight keyhole, like right between you guys, and I gotta shoot the gap, and I go back, they'll most of the time spin opposite of the cast I just given. But you kind of got to practice it a little bit. And you don't want to overuse it. But it can be very... Because I did it with my dog once. I gave her a back and she, I think I... She went right, she dug right, and she dug left. So then I just yelled back and she went straight back. Yeah. And, so and, she, and she did spin. You're right, you're wrong. Your mistakes were wait but this dog's in the brain of yoga. How do I give the total opposite of a directional change? Give no hands at all. Yeah, that, that is that is the theory behind it. I was like, it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Cool. And it's something you can overuse. But. Could that have worked with? Because um, I have used that on my dog, and it did exactly what you said. I was on a peninsula, but would that have worked with the third cast here? With instead of using a right arm, you you would just say verbally. Back. Would that have spun the door in the opposite direction? It could have. It could I mean, have, it's, right? it's a little bit unpredictable. I mean, I would have done the right it, uh, I'll tell you what, it depends on where I stop. If I stop and tighter her on line, now that's what I, uh, some people, I think, I can't remember who I was. Might have been, might have been on Danielle. Uh, yeah. There were times where I said, you, were, you weren't picky enough on the danger side and you were too picky on the safe side. And you were my, so there were times where you stopped them and you're dead on line. Like you finally got the task you wanted. Yeah, if I stop them on line, I give a verbal no hand, but then I go, oh. Yeah. I stopped them, I didn't, I, I have a habit of, of being too quick and not letting it see, right. but then I also get slapped on the wrist because Yeah, I mean, some long. people will stop them right here. Now you have, they've got nowhere to go. Yeah. yeah. And really kind quick. of like anything I give up, I'm going to put it back over here. So. Yeah. Sometimes it's just, you know, sometimes you just get anxious and, and you get, you, 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 yeah. you yeah. oh, shoot, it's a little bit more. Then you were saying down, you were trying to tell me, Andrew, you said talking about down the shore. Is there something different, like if you're running well, a dog straight down the I mean, if this is a shoreline, um, I, you know, it's down the shore, it's all dependent on one. It's just like, it's just interpreting the power of the factor that's influencing it. So obviously water is a huge influence. And what, and depending on what they're, now some dogs may 
want to go out the middle of the pond and want to be safe, right? Some dogs can't wait to get out of the water. So it's just interpreting the intent of the dog, reading the power of the factor, and to some degree, the down the shore thing, if your dog's well trained, there's clarity and context to what you're asking. So sometimes I, if, if they're starting to break to the shore, they go going like this, boom, I stop right here. He knows why I stop him. I stop him because I don't want him to get, jump up on this piece of land. So I may give that silent laugh and say, don't you dare get up there. I want you to stay in the water. So there's, if there's more, I'll tell you, getting dogs to understand and feel a crosswind is something you can't see. It's really tricky, but you can see land versus water. If it comes, you know, when they're, when they're, when they're understanding and you've done your basics well, and they understand the rules of it, it's, it's actually makes it easier. Same if that's a slope instead of the wind. What's that? Same as if that was a slope instead of the wind. Well, you're right. Sometimes terrain is. You're right. Now you add. Okay. Example. I mean, you do a couple things. You add side hill yeah, like and the wind. Like we had. Right. You know, and then you've got lots of factors working in sync. Um, you know, so that becomes tricky. Uh, what are the top five drills for a beginning dog? Uh, wagon wheel. Wagon wheel. I mean, it's basic wagon wheel drills like eight white bumpers. Um, and, and all of the, and there are two major wagon wheel drills. One is a casting drill, one is a mining drill. So, wagon wheel casting and mining. Uh, certainly the pile work thing we did yesterday. So go and stop. So basic no-no drills where you want to jump a pile, or jump up, you know, you put a piece of brush or a little, um, you know, it's, and, and I'll tell you, some fundamental tuna drills. I mean, and, and I think maybe this is a good time to know where we are, what our conditions are, I don't even know what time it is. Maybe this is a good time for us to go out. And uh, there's two things that I think are valuable to show here. Would be how to do a white and oil drill and how I like to do it. And uh, either designing a land tune up and maybe running one or two dogs and just showing how they, how they interact and how it might evolve. So I think that's when I looked around there. Those are two probably pretty good things to do. So let's just let's talk logistics here. Um, are you doing lunch again? Yes. Yeah, we wanted to talk to you and see. We weren't really sure how long this was going to go this morning, but we're here. Well, it makes sense to do a couple of drills. And eat lunch and then go off. That's what I think makes sense. Because it's still right. Now, we're not the only people I'm sensitive about. Are our uh, gunners that we've got coming at a certain time? So, um, yeah, they were going to be here at noon. Right. You can you can you mitigate and have them come here for lunch at noon, and then we'll go from here. Oh, we, you know, we certainly good to feed the health. <laughs> Where can people find this article? Here's a really good article you wrote about tune-up drills that was from another yeah. seminar. But I know you have. Where? Yeah, I know I wrote that in, uh, I think, in the Trigger News, and maybe it was even. No, but I think that. What's it say? More about tune ups? It's the Rip Fire tune up drill. Oh, I did a, I, yeah, I did a real complex water tune up in Michigan. And, um, uh, I mean, I know it's on my computer. Um, one option would be, I mean, and you've got it from a previous notebook. Well, yeah, well, huh. but yeah, this was from that uh, Sweetwater. I don't know if Bill and Anna put together or what, but um, there's a bunch. I mean, you have good articles out there. Yeah, that and I know I've got to recycle something, and I'm going to retrieve it next year. This is a rib fire tune-up drill. Yeah, it happened to be a, a water tune-up drill that I did, and uh, in Michigan, and I did it uh, the full long, multiple days. And uh, I'm, I'm sure I can locate it. One option, if somebody has access to a copier, might be to. You want me to copy it? Well, oh, you're coming tomorrow. Okay. I can't come tomorrow. Oh, well, you don't want to give it up then. 
or let somebody, you know, what? I'll tell you what, um, most of these phones, you can just take a picture and scan it, and you want if you to, wanted it. Do you allow me to do it all? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something about the blind? Yes. Okay. If you are an HRC person and you do all that stuff and you do not change where your dog is going to end up, those are all paths you can do. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're talking about yeah. really all, certainly all these. And if they, if they never Go back and blood never ends up going toward the uh, where the blind is. You can't fail. And it's really hard for AKC people to understand that because they think every one of those hats to be closer to the blind. But that's not So all the AKC people who think that your dog should have passed, that's the reason. <laughs> your dog has to change where it's going to end. So don't let them get that far. So really, that's an AKC versus an HRC thing? Or is that just a certain judge versus a certain judge? No, that's, that's the way they're judging. I mean, and that, that would be more typical of the sport that I spent my life doing, field drills. I mean, you're right. I mean, this, now depending on the quality of your previous series, will determine, and the, and the, and the overall work, whether something like this would get eliminated or yeah, and you fail any you fail any ticket. They call it failure as game over. And but if they call it poor, but not a failure, then it may just be a big game towards it. But and I'll tell you, if I felt that way, I mean so the ideal thing is to have things where maybe bushes or outside areas like so you're not only offline, you've completely lost control and then it kinda of takes care of itself. In that case it's okay to get on over. Oh, it's always over. So do you, so when you say that, do you care at all what calves the handler gives? Do you pay any attention to the calves the handler gives? So why do you say it's okay to give it away? Why is it ever not okay to give it away? Oh, it is. But for some reason, the yeah. AKC people, you can't give them over. I know. Yeah. I don't know what day that starts. I mean, get over that. <laughs> you do what you got to do to get up and put yourself in a favorable position. Yeah. No, because I just started master, and everyone's been telling me, don't give any overs once you get to the test. So I've been trying to figure that out. This is just a challenge. Yeah. And then boy comes around, and then everybody says, oh my God, don't give an over. Oh my God, you you know, and so on. I know plenty of AKC judges that would make those big transfer fusions, which is what you're saying. Right. Um, and, and, and the thing about no overs, it's... It's not a written rule, and plenty of judges are perfectly okay with an over. Would I give one? I don't think about it, but I hope not to need to do it. Well, that's right. I mean, it's certainly because, I mean, it's, it becomes uh, your last lifeline, your safety right. rule. But we screwed up if we're doing an over, but sometimes we screw up. Might as well try and save it. And I'll tell you, I, I, probably the most famous over I ever saw was uh, watching my party run a lot and handle the chance a lot. Yeah. And, a national St. Louis match and she won. And they had a poison bird really close to the line. And Mike got a little slow and the poison bird's here. And Monty's looking at the bird, looking at him, looking at the bird. Yes. Yeah, right. And he went, oh! and she, she looked at it and said, nah, better not. And she got out of the line and got through it and won that match. So, you know what? I mean, you do what you got to do to get through. And you do the best job you think you can do with the situation you're in. And quit worrying about what the judge is. Great. Let me judge it. Well, part of the natural and over is because it says you're supposed to make, um, what is it? For the progress to the blind. Progress to the blind, and an over is not progress to the blind. Well, it depends whether that's what, what you give is what they take. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you can use it, but that's why people don't think you can. Right. But, okay, so if you get an order right here and the dog takes the perfect order and then you give it back, what's wrong with that? I mean, I don't think you think anything wrong with that either. But listen, I mean, I, uh, now, 
I'm not telling you, I mean, and there's some old time handlers, good overs and backs is all they gave. And there was a guy, a client of mine, said that. I mean, he had two caps, it was over or back. I mean, that's the only two caps he ever did. So he would just handle that way. And he won a lot of field trials. And so it was just his style. You know, ideally, a judge doesn't watch anything the handler does, he only watches the dog and the destination. Is he challenging the test? Is he keeping him online? It should be almost that simple. I think. But, you know, but keeping him online is what I always interpret is why did the judge pick that line? What were his key points? And did I challenge the hazard of the test? And if there's a bush right here, and the line is to the right of the bush, and being on the right side of the bush makes it more challenging for me because it puts because the crosswind is a bigger factor. And somebody lets him post on the upwind side, I'm not gonna like that because I'm gonna say, you know, that isn't the blind we set up. Everybody that did the blind to the right of that bush put themselves at greater risk, and that's the blind I set up. And if you do that and you show me that, I'm gonna like that blind better. That's all. Do you have multiple de cheat methods? Well, certainly, uh, I mean the, the initial de cheating starts with teaching the dog to swim by. I mean, in, in a basic program, that's where you teach them to take water and come back to the water on your turf. Um, and then you've got, and, and we all do some degree of the initial teaching where with a puppy, maybe, when you throw a white cover on your team and he starts running around, you know, you may call back and throw it and move up and try to show him to go straight. But once formal basics start, uh, swim by is the first step. And you know, there's the whole the multiple steps of swim by where you you teach them the back pile, you force them in the water, you make them come back um, into the water and return, you cast them to the right over, you move over and receive them at the other end of the pond, and they start to want to run around, and you move and you teach them to jump back in, and then you teach them the whole swim by thing, and then you teach them to do basic sight lines that look like a swim by channel, and then you start with cheating singles where you throw a mark for tree with one factor, maybe get a corner of the water, and you teach them how to handle the cast and understand what it means to be handled on a mark to deal with the factor, in this instance, the factor of water, and you teach them the language of being of, of being handled to not cheat, and then you gradually complicate that with multiple factors and re-entries and stay in the water and all of the other water cheat scenarios. Um, and then throughout their life, with tuna drills and things like that, you are con in three peaks. You're constantly working on the balance. And deep cheating isn't just getting in the water. The deep cheating is really going straight. So it's not just go off the middle of the pond and stay away from land. It's take. It's having a balanced behavior on the water. Because some dogs, it's pretty easy to get them worried about getting out of the water. But that's not what we want. We want to teach them. The beauty of going straight and taking skinny water and angles and tight to shore but not out of the water. So as you get more and more complex uh, uh, water tune-ups that have multiple lines that have with similar factors is one of the best and most advanced ways to really uh, uh, emphasize and uh, kind of de cheating and going straight. And I like to do chain singles in almost that look like a water tuna drill that have simple, you do one and you do it and you perfect it, you may repeat it, then you move over a little bit and you do another one that resembles it, and you do another one that resembles it, and you do it multiple days in a row. But chain singles are marks treated like blinds with specific clear factors that you handle them through. And Rex didn't call them cheating signals, he called them advanced watermarking procedures. <laughs> and it really is a better word for it, because you think it's cheating, it's just, oh, it's water versus land. And Rex would say, you can go anywhere you want to go as long as you don't go out of your way to get there. <laughs> and that's really the case. It, 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 it's the balance factor of going straight and understanding and not being neurotic about it, but being clear. And some dogs are just naturally better at it than others. Some of you fight the, 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 the land eye dominant thing their whole life. And so you try to you try to manage that. Mm -hmm. Alright, so if so on either side, and I kind of I think I covered that. 
Uh, how do you adjust your standard method if it is too? Okay. Or how do you adjust your standard method if it is to make the shore hot? Uh, I, that's I, I'm not a hot spot guy. Now I'm not saying I don't correct it, but it doesn't. I, what I, here's what I don't do. I don't let a dog swim ten yards out of its way, get on land, and clog it. I I try to communicate, and I somebody said, and I'm not afraid to correct a dog in the water. I manage it, but I think if you, I mean, get over the idea that all of a sudden there's this all of a sudden increased anxiety about a collar correction in the water versus on land. Now, you got to be sensible because they're not as comfortable in the water, but it doesn't increase the intensity. And when you do swim by, swim by is intended to do one thing: is to condition and get them to understand about pressure. Around and in the water. It's not just when they hit land. It's not just big, it's it's just part of the process. So you have to teach them how to do it. And yes, I admit that's why we've got variable intensity collars. That's why I manage it accordingly. But if I only correct a dog from land and not the water, you couldn't do what you did do today. You dogs wouldn't understand it. It's not you would be you would not be communicating at the point of infraction. You, you wouldn't be given half the time the cheat starts in the water. I mean, what do you do then? You let them cheat for 10 yards and then correct them when they get out. I don't know, that's not, that's not the way I do it. That's not the way I've been taught to do it. For, and, and I'll tell you, tuna drills were originally called panic What would you say? P-A-N-I-C. Okay, and they were oftentimes done after a series of cheating signals. Because a lot of whistles that happened around the water were associated with cheats and were accompanied by corrections. So yes, they build anxiety. So you would do tuna drills to get a dog comfortable with lots of whistles around. That didn't necessarily mean they were getting corrected. So they were a balancing factor. Now, now mind you, some of these drills and hand drills and some of these things go back to the time where we had one intensity of the power. It was a high five. No momentary for every dog. So it was too severe for a lot of them. And dogs, you know, we have the, the whole retriever breed, especially Labradors, are much more sensitive now than they used to be. They're much more, because we've learned how to train the sensitive dog, we've become more thoughtful. The sensitive dog didn't survive at one time. And if you saw the, the style of training way before cows, <laughs> yes. you would be here. <laughs> I was weird. I mean, you know, it, it was, I mean, the, the methods were group, but we would come along. So, um, you know, they take it on different hands. But yes, I mean, I but to teach a dog to understand and be in control of pressure and not be afraid of it is the first step. And to avoid conditioning a dog to understanding it because they're sensitive. Is a dead end street. It's not going to work anymore. You've got to find just, and it's just as much as necessary and as little as possible. I just want to change behavior. And I don't want to condition a dog to ignore or endure pressure. Internalizing is a bad thing. And it's easy to do with nick, 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 and all of a sudden they just say, well, I guess that's just what happens. I guess I was a little uncomfortable, but I guess I'll just. It's like sitting in the dentist chair, you're getting your tooth. I mean, you're not going to do a lot. You just have to sit there. And I don't want that to be the case. You've really done your dog a disservice if they got to the point where pressure doesn't mean anything. It's just a consequence of life. So that's why you work real hard to hold that good responsibility. So, Rick. Can we go back to the freezing? Okay. You know about freezing on a bird? Right. On delivery. Yes. Yeah. You, I think you said partway in, in your explanation of everything was that something to the effect you already want to have this tool in your toolbox, so if it occurs, you want to be able to use it. So, do you insert that somewhere in the horse fetch? Yeah, when I, I mean, I spend all when I do fetch to the pile. I, I spend more time 
than I think most people do. And part of it is getting them to reject our commands and to be real. I mean, I don't necessarily go to the full force drop thing where they spit it to the ground, but I certainly get to the point where I don't have to take the bumper. They learn that drop means to expel it. You know, and I take it in my hand and I and I make sure I so I'm methodical about it and I do when I do pile work, I mean and I don't know if Danny still does this. You've talked about Danny Judy's force reps, and I have a tape that I and I probably need to watch it or anything, but I've watched it because I've well, I've been with them. Do they pyramid bumpers still? Do they stack them in a pyramid? Now one of the other things they would do, they would like one of the later steps to get it on to talk about shopping, they would take like five bumpers and then put four in the gap and, and create a pyramid and the dog would have to go in and, and you know they wouldn't correct, but they would they would get to the point where they would learn to pluck a bumper out of that and come up and sit. Now it wasn't it seems a little extreme, I don't do it anymore, but I'm telling you, that would be the point that they would and so when the dog would get frustrated about not getting the bumper. He might come out without it, and you take a bumper out and do a fetch with a little neck, and you really continue to improve it in more challenging situations. That's really all that's doing. They have two videos with force, force fetch. One is just the force fetch. The other one, they have, uh, it's called basics. Right. I think they have six different things in there. That relate to that. that no, the obedience, force fetch, um, Swim by, um, force to the pile, or T, and I can't remember what the other ones are. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I know, I mean, listen, in my sleep, I, I know it's that. I mean, you know, when I was talking, you know, when I start talking about work, dragging a check for 60% of the way through the double T, I mean, it was, there was no deviation from that. And I will tell you, the force inspection are basic. And don't well, why, just, you know, guys, better, I thought. They might there's a deeper good. meaning to all this. Pat Nolan, who does uh, a lot of detection dogs, and he does, he does incredible things with these Malamos, with night vision and earbuds and guiding in the buildings and doing searching. But every one of those dogs, he force fetches. Yes. And then why do you force fetch a dog and pick up? Because he thinks there's no clear understanding for a dog to understand and, and respect and, and monitor and deal with pressure than that situation like that. It is the most hands-on basic form of a dog learning to understand pressure and respond to it quickly. And even dogs that aren't going to retreat, he'll force us because he feels that's the best way he can communicate. So in some of these steps of basics, it isn't the lesson that you're doing that's the most critical thing. It's the life lesson that it is a clear and under healthy response to being trained and the communication between you and your dog and the understanding that not every day is going to be sunny, but the sky is going to fall, you're going to get up, it's going to work, and you're going to work through adversity and you build a pattern of dealing with problems that you can that you can work through to think that you're never going to have problems and avoid all issues. And once again, it's just a formula for long-term disaster. But once you get through all these things and you encounter little little mountains to climb, then you and the dog both have the confidence that you're going to work through trouble. And these things that come up on a daily basis aren't big deals. How early do you start with a puppy, the formal uh, course fetching? You know, the the standard protocol is what everybody says is once once they get their adult teeth. And that's, I, I think I still, for the Six most part, months. do Six, that. Seven months, yeah. But sometimes you wait longer because the dog is just maturity-wise and everything. They're not ready for it. Now, I tell you what, I mean, there's a lot of people, Connie included, she's got a, ever see that performance puppy primer thing? She, I mean, they do a lot of things with these oh. really small puppies. Now, most of them are marker, reward-based, food-based, to get them to start to learn and engage their brain. But I think the formal pressure for stuff doesn't typically happen until that age. And, you know, we always used to say, you know, classic basics typically start at about eight months of age. And classic basics typically take three to five months to complete. Depending on the dog. 
you know. And if you're in a hurry to rush through that stuff, you've probably not done a thorough enough job. And you know, it's it's easier to get it right the first time than to you know to fly through some things that just aren't fun for you, um, and then end up wishing you had done a better job down the road. So that's the you know, that's the process. But keeping a good attitude. I mean, and I don't emphasize enough the importance of maintaining a good attitude. I mean, I want to make it fun. I want to balance it. I don't want yard work to be a drudgery. So all this stuff, even though I'm, you hear me preaching discipline, I want to have a dog with a good attitude. So I'm going to throw marks, I'm going to do things, I'm going to keep the sessions lively, I may do them short. Uh, you know, I use praise when appropriate, not overused, because I want it to be powerful. And, you know, that's just the, that's, that's, that's the agenda that I try to follow. So. We good? Okay, okay. okay. I, I didn't write fast enough. Um, when you were saying you just put your hand over the dog and you line it up like with his nose, mm -hmm. and then if you move it forward, it makes him go. Well, anything forward influences the dog away from you. Okay. And I say away from you because if you're two sided, I if I said it just influences the left. Well, if he's on the right, it influences the right. Okay. But you know what? For the most part, my hand is typically directly over the tip of their nose above their line of sight, but in their peripheral vision. So if you can kind of picture what that might look like. Mm -hmm. I want them to be aware of it. I don't want them to be, I don't want them to be invasive with that, look around it or That's the hand that, and my hand typically comes in and it's, and my and send is out off of a stationary hand. And I don't, I don't, as I'm a child. Oh. Some people go, BAM! <laughs> Do this, yeah. you know, because ideally any influence is going to, you know, any movement is going to have some sort of influence. And when I get it right, I don't really want it to be, <laughs> and I don't want the movement of the hand being what I'm sending. I want. I want it to be my voice. The hand is only an indicator that you're about to be sent. It's a sequence of events. Sequence of events that leads up to sending on the truth. That's why it's sending to them. Okay. In the water, scalloping, how do you untwist them? Are you stopping? Well, okay, wait a minute. I'm, I'm not untwisting them, but they're scalloping. Okay. So you've got basically that. This thing, that this yeah. is a shoreline? Basically, yeah, and you've got basically, yeah. For the most part, I don't treat it any differently than I do on land. Now, um, if the scout puts them on the land, then sometimes, you know, but I don't let the dog scout from here to here get out and then clobber them. I, I would probably address it when they start breaking. Because when they start going towards land is when they've decided to get out. Yeah. It's not when they get out. Now, if I'm, if I'm just treating it like, a, like an underground fence with what you're talking you know, a hot spot thing, but that's really an archaic way to try to trim it off. I mean, actually, to be honest with you, it's what they did back in the old day. When they got out, they shot them with a shotgun. <laughs> yes, that's how they trained. They shot them with a bird shot at 60 yards. And then they go to the vet and they get their hips done and they and say, well, what's that in this butt? Pellets. Yeah. So, I mean, but that's, they had to do it that way because they couldn't have the dog be turned around walking out of them. He get blind, but plenty of that can actually happen. I they got that. I mean, and I, I only witnessed the beginning of that. And then we started using collars, and they said collars were cruel. Which are casting, 
one of which is wine. The eight-handed casting is the one that most people know, that I just described. There's also one called a two-handed back drill. And I'll, I'll explain that. And now, and now, wagon wheel fighting drill, there is eight-leg wagon wheel, 16-leg wagon wheel, and I, and, or some people call it one-tier, two-tier wagon wheel. What you see here is a two-tier. You got eight white bumpers and eight red bumpers in the gaps of the whites. The 32-leg drill, and do we have any more bumpers here? Give me a couple. I'm going to just throw them out. Oh, Danielle's already getting nervous. Getting nervous. I'm going to have you put the third. And if we do nothing more than show you what it might look like. So walk up by the downspout. Yep. No. I want one. I want like two at the, leave two at the uh, big ones when you come by. But go ahead, right up to the gravel. Okay, babe, baby step that way. Right there. All right, go that way. Right there with the toe of the, uh, angle back a little bit. Ever try to handle a person? Right there, good. Keep going, walk right towards the tree. <laughs> Does he sit on the whistle? Good. Go to the uh, yellow flower. Yeah, right there. Good. Come towards me a little. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's fine. Right there is fine. All right. Come on. That's enough of those. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, I want you to go to the jumbos and lay another bumper on top of the jumbos. So we have two at tier two. Just They don't have to make it more visible. I just want two of them there. Just, just lay it next to it. I mostly want to, yeah. So we got two, two. Mostly there. Um, actually, Rick, go ahead and do these over here. We don't need it done there so much. Because if I, I'm going to demonstrate, uh, Slate has never done, yeah, three tier. But just put one there and, and one there, and then that's enough. And I like to do it. I mean, I don't want you... We're not, I mean, we can demonstrate with it that has perfected this, but it's most more interesting to per do it with a dog that hasn't perfected it. So one thing she's doing, she's got a tab on, right? That is a, good. You can hear me good on the speaker, everybody? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, come on up. So somebody asked me, like on the double blind, some people point back at the blind they just picked up and then move them off of it. That's what you're going to do here with the, you're going to pick up a series of white bumpers. But one first thing I want you to do, okay, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to tell you yet. First thing I want you to do is, is get him healed properly on the mat. I want you on the mat. And I want you to do a 360 healing drill clockwise. So go point at there. Okay. Now, I let's make him sit though. Okay. One more move. Show me your, bring your right foot back step and point at this white bump. Okay, your move is going to point at this white bumper. And remember what we talked, this move here? Okay. Here. One thing he does is rock back a little bit. I'm trying to work Well, he's, you know, he, he's, he's a little owly, but, you know, until you do a couple of retrieves. Okay, rotate him and pick up that white bumper right there. Yep. 
So this is where I want you to, this is where you start practicing your cadence. Now, your hand position. Okay, and that's called the no-no procedure. That's where you recall them to get a different initial line. Now, some of these guys will overthink this. They, they that sometimes they'll think this is the don't pick up the white bumper drill. Yeah. <laughs> so you can It's really the go where you're pointed drill. Okay, good boy. And he's a little bit worried. So, so bring him back. This is where you get tested at how good you're. Now, I want you to point back where he just was. Here. Hand me the bumper. Unless you're a certified bumper thrower outer. No. I paint. I paint. Okay, rotate to that, to that one and pick up that one. Okay, so you, you're going to practice your, okay, good rotation. I want you guys to pay attention. Now, make him sit. Uh, because you're demonstration mode, this is the line I draw. Base of the tail, middle of the shoulder blades, center of the head. Try to have it all in alignment at the target. Now, you're just going to practice doing that. So, you know, I don't want them kind of curled around you. I want them... Good. So you're going to pick up a couple whites. Go ahead, you can throw it back. We'll see how good you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> It's easier when it's cold, because the bumpers aren't, they don't bounce as much. So, you know, everybody's done some version of this, but, okay, but I want him to sit. Oh, well, he'll get over that. Okay, put your hand down where you think it should be. Let me see your hand position. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, mine is more this-ish, but, you know, some people, like, you watch Ray Vogt, he's like, he has a low elbow. But more important, sit. It's okay. I um, I mean, that is, so, just take a look at that. That's, that's by him. But, you know, she's good. Her, his shoulder, her knee. Oh, here, here, here. It's all right. Here. Tell him sit. Go, tell him to sit, go up, receive him, put the bumper down, bring him back. This is, for the most part, there's no collar corrections here. The purist would have a, have a healing stick. You'd have it underneath your armpit on the opposite side. I mean, if you were wanting to adjust and they weren't working with you, you'd kind of, you know, you'd rotate and you'd tap them a little bit to, sh to work on moving. So she's doing things like, well, okay, move up two steps, move up two steps. Now there's a certain degree of relax it, you know, when, when they're overthinking it like him. Of, you don't want to be too aggressive because you don't want to sweat him because he's, he's, he's thinking like he's not supposed to get the white bumper. Because I'm now what I what okay so what she's practicing is the first look pattern. Initially, when I do white bumpers, I usually point back at the previously retrieved blind, throw the bumper out, and heal them off of it. Because you know what that is? That's your first poison bird. You throw a mark? No, nope, we're not going to get it. We're going to rotate. Just real simple. Not just. Say, I've never done a poison bird. She just did a poison bird. Well, if you watched him, he's a little bit like, he's a little worried by nature. And he's probably done these and made the mistakes. So he thinks like, and she's done, she said, oh, I've done a lot of these. Once they kind of say, oh, and they but no, then they think, oh, I can't have those. There's a certain degree of almost like, almost like a short bird. Now, Danielle, I want you to slow down. You're starting to get amped up. 
Tell them to sit. Without, without being too mean, just make them sit, though. This could be a more of a casual hand. It'd be a little softer hand. Okay, good. So many reasons this is good. Okay, but I mean, I'm, I'm already twitching. She's grabbing a bumper with him standing up. I mean, guys, the only way you're going to be do this all the time is to do it all the time. Don't be sloppy. Be methodical. It's got to be muscle memory. Uh, pick up a uh, second tier. Pick up one of the red bumpers. Okay, good. Now you're not going to throw this out. So that you can just dump behind you. Now pick up the white one to the right of it. I'll mix it up. I mean, a lot of times you do go white and then re red, but uh, you do the interior tier and then go to the next. But because he wants to do this, I'm thinking like, oh, it's probably better for him. Now this is also the dog that was afraid to go back in on the short bird. Coincidence? No, it's not coincidence. It's his nature. It's what. That's. He's got a little bit of a warrior streak to him. No. Move up. Now I'm a. It feels a little counterproductive with him. Okay, good. Now throw that back out. Now I'm going to do something to him just for therapy. Throw it out and send back to the one you just threw out. Okay. Now throw it back out. Now do the red bumper to the right of it. Here. Too much. Here. I want you on the mat. Danielle's a good sport here, so I'm picking on her. No. Now he says, oh, well, the white bumpers are okay. <laughs> And again, it's not a correction, it's just a communication. You condition them to accept being known in a way, you do a little bit, of, and it's attrition, you deny the process, he gives in a little bit, he starts to feel good about it. Isn't that funny? He went from not wanting them to only wanting them. You can, I would probably use a stick, a little bit of a tap with a stick, or a tab with a little bit of a jerk. I, I wouldn't be against using it. No. Move up, three steps. This is like the perfect spot for this. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. I mean, it's just... I guess they're just, they're dogs. I mean, it, it's, now, she keeps moving closer. Which is what you want to do. I mean, I, I don't know what to, you know, it's really peculiar, isn't it? You couldn't get him to go for him. Now, good dog, good dog. That's a good dog. I mean, whatever in his mind, he had a little mental block. Okay. Now, let's, let's do, let's do that white bumper and then the red bumper to the right of it. Just try to clear them out.
Lori, you're next. Me? Yep. Yeah, you. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> okay, throw it back. Let's do the red bumper to the right of that. See, that's the perfect quarter step. That's the move that you, that's hard to practice, is that little bit of... Okay. Pick up the white bumper to the right of that. I want to go white, red, white, red. It just feels like the pattern that... And, no, no, you don't have to throw that out. Yeah, do the white bumper. Okay. All right, throw the bumper back, do the red. <laughs> Make them sit. Okay. I say you quit. Okay, tell me what you've just figured out. That you like small bumpers more than big bumpers? <laughs> Tell me. I figured out as soon as my rhythm with my throwback sit, then shift, his line was better, the nervousness went down. It was more me settling into the rhythm of, yeah. we're going for this one. Nope, we're going for this one. Yeah, and I think he was feeding, initially he was feeding, you were kind of like, I'm on stage, I'm a little worried. Yeah, yeah. And he, I think he was feeding that, feeling that energy that you were kind of giving up. Yeah. Saying, okay, that's the one you just went for. No, here, we're going here, and my line was clear, and my rhythm was better. Great. Then he, that's, I think that's where he started to get stacked. I do too. And, and we finished with three or four pretty nice ones, and he felt good about it. And, you know, would I go longer than that? Maybe, but I don't have to, I don't have to pick up all 32 bumpers. I go with the, I mean, and I, I find something that, like, at that point, it felt like there was a lot of merit and value in um, just working through that adversity that he was feeling. Because he started to make a lot of mistakes. But what did we say about developing memory and security in the unknown? This is where you start to do it. You nurture him through it. You tell him, get over it, buddy. You're going to work through this. You're going to move up. You're going to help him. You're going to reward him when he tries. And they're going to start to get emboldened and start to feel better. Like, okay, I can do this. And then, you, you know, and then... It, you could feel them build. Like he started to, like we'd have done a few more. He just start. Then he, then we probably would have been correcting him for creeping because he probably would have been like all jacked up. Well, I need to do. I only have half a crescent to but I need to probably mow and set up. A well, just because you get full rotation. I mean, that's why I, I kind of like to do that. Yeah. Now, there's a listen, and you think deeper than just getting a dog to line and go straight. There's obviously the healing mechanics. There's obviously the 360 healing, the communication to go left and right. There's obviously the working on your cadence and sending rhythm. Um, there's obvious the knowing and calling back and starting over. But there's also the communication and teamwork of you being able to, she started to settle in a little bit, relax a little bit. She so, he softened up. He started to, you know, and how you kind of controlled your own energy. And I'll tell you one thing, if, come over here and look at this for a second. And everybody can. When you start doing three tiers, <coughs> white, red, red, okay? <coughs> what goes on here in a 25 yard deal is not unlike, that's the flyer. That's the other gun. There's the retired gun up the middle. That's the flyer. Boom, boom. The communication to say, go get the obvious bird, get the semi-obvious bird, let's work on the bird you don't know what's going on. I mean, that ability to step up and influence and talk them into, into going to that bumper after you've picked up these two, or even initially going for that bumper, that bumper, and that bumper. That's outside, outside, middle. Boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. It's, it's like you're doing 10 triples in, 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 a thir in a 20 minute session. It's the same rhythm, same communication, same process, same first look, same hand position. It's identical, and if you do it, you do it hundreds of times, and it, it's what it takes.
You know, it just takes incredible amount of reps. Um, in every June, I would do a big water tune-up with all of the dogs at hand jump that weren't at the, in that hadn't gone to the national amateur. Kind of my second, and I ran 108 water blinds in one day. Myself, one day, 108 blinds. I bet you I blew seven, eight hundred whistles in one day. Seven, eight hundred times, I decided the timing of the blow. I had to do, communicate the cast. I had to calculate everything that we looked at on the board. I had to line up and move and adjust. Take that over the course of a 38-year career. Now, I didn't do 100 water blinds every day of 38 years, but can you imagine how in the tens of thousands of times? So you just don't underestimate. I know you get frustrated and you want to get it to, by the end of the weekend, you want to have it all figured out. Well, it's not. It just takes a ridiculous amount of reps to just, and this gives you lots of reps. Wayne Curtis's flyer gunner, who shot for him all the time, said, Wayne, how many flyers do you think I've shot for you since 2001? And this guy, and, I, and Wayne said, I don't have a clue. He said, 13,462. You thought, like, holy shit. All right, that's a lot of flyers. But every one of those flyers probably had two dead birds with it. So that's 26, that's 40,000 retrieves. 40 thousand times in the course of a half a year, in the course of a third of a career, that guy stood next to a dog, looked down, influenced, and sent, and made decisions. It's a quarter of a million times, probably. I mean, I bet you, now I would say to some of you guys, you may not have run 108 water blinds in your career, <laughs> let alone in one day. So I'm not, I just want you to be patient and realize it takes two baby steps, you're gonna make mistakes, but these kinds of things give you lots of opportunities and reps to work on all of the subtleties. So. Uh, <laughs> I have a question about the mechanics of this. So I wanna teach uh, Tayoga to not pick her butt up every time I turn because she does that in obedience. So if I'm doing dip drill, it's, it's unreasonable to go from there to there without picking Correct. So how do I, where do I start to make that judgment? When is that, what now, I'm asking? I wouldn't be as able her butt pinned to the ground. I think the big staying in, it's not totally practical in some situations to get the dog to just scoot. But I mean, if they got to do this, I, I think that's fine. I mean, um, but what isn't fine is you go like this and they end up out there. That's what you want to discourage. Now, that's one, now, one of the ways I do it is have that tab on it and have it loose. And when I do it and they start to move into the, you know, and you could, if, if, if you need a pinch collar because you want to make it a little more uncomfortable, or if you just want it on your, the D-ring on your electric collar to just guide them through it. Sometimes when you're changing something, I'm only giving that to coach them into understanding what, how to do it better. I'm not necessarily correcting it. Right, yes. And I'll tell you, I mean, and like, for, I'll tell you what, this is a classic thing for, for, for influencing because being able to tell whether the dog's looking at that bumper or that bump, I mean, that, that's a fairly small area, is it not? So you've got their spine, let's say their spine is at the green stripe between tier two and tier three. That's a reasonably good spine alignment. But you're thinking like, is he gonna go like this and dive for this bumper, or is he gonna go through? So my move right there might be that quarter step forward to influence their, shift their weight, boom, just a click. Just, and now, but if I do this, and they do this, I haven't gained anything. And that's what you see a lot of times. I say step up and the dogs, I said, well step up doesn't work if they walk, if they, if they don't allow you to influence them. So that's where you, You'll take that tab, and you'll step up, and if you anticipate it, and they start to move, you say, sit. Or you give them a tug back, and you allow that, and then now, all of a sudden, you shift the weight, and their spine goes from there to there. And they may go here, and you say, and I don't, and again, I don't say no, I say here. Or if they look there, I step up. They look here, I say here. And when I get them glancing in the middle, I say, sit. And I want to get practicing telling them where to go instead of asking them where to look. The only time I may ask them where to look 
is with Slate when he was too worried about going for the white bumpers. I wanted to tell him it's, it's kind of okay to get that one. And that might be the one that blind right at the gun's feet that I say, okay, right there, you're good with that one. And I may, but the other ones, I want to get comfortable saying, here, sit, you're going there because I'm telling you. And even if I know they're going to break for this and they're going like this, I'm going to go with my best look and send and they go, nope, and I move up. And I may end up running this before I'm done from right here. But all of a sudden they're going like this and they go and they get it, good dog. And all of a sudden the next one, I'm able to only move up to there. And the next one, I only have to move up to there. And each way I just get a little bit better and they get a little bit more confident. And they start, and I, some people want to go out and mark these. No, I want to teach them how to deal with the unknown. I want to teach them to work through confusion and adversity. I want to teach them what to do when they don't know what to do. They still got to go, they still got to stop. They just got to keep trying. I'll show you through it. And each time you, you, you nurture them through the process, they become more confident that the sky isn't going to fall. And that's how you do it. And it's not through pressure. It's through, the pressure is only through the recall, the bearing down, keep trying. And if they decide not to go, I'm not saying it hasn't turned into a fetch, you're going to pick up that bumper fetch session. But if it does, so be it. Don't shy away from it. It just shows you like, well, at this point, they decided it's not fun for me. I'm going to quit. No, you're not going to quit. You're going to go up. You're going to do this. And when you do do it, I'm going to reward you. And you're going to take, teach a soft dog to be more resilient and stronger and bolder. And now they're going to, and when you can bring that sensitive dog that wants to use, wants to be passive aggressive and not try to trying and feel good about trying, now you're on your way to real something special. Then you can do all the shit you want in the field. They'll, they're on it. But it starts with this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where I want to rotate. If I'm only wanting to influence without physically moving the dog's body, it's a step forward. Now, the, the, nobody's asked the question, but some people influence with the outside leg versus the inside leg. Now, the outside leg is more the fine-tuned leg. I mean, it may be just an eye flick. The inside leg makes a, broad, a stronger statement. So if I want to, like, say, don't you dare go back to that flyer, the white bumper, I may go up in here, boom, and make and close the door on that temptation. And when I say close the door, I mean step forward and take the, the daylight between you and the dog out of the picture and, 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 and close the door to the temptation on everything to the right. When I open the door, I give permission to go right. When I close the door, I tell them not to go right. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, Rick. He's like the bobblehead? Oh, yeah. So it's better to step up and stay there. Step up and, stay there. and I'd square up with the other leg. Yeah, I mean, there's times where I'm, my knee is right by their ear. Yeah. Right, right down, I mean, and, and that's that close talker thing. I'm right in their space. Well, uh, sometimes when they become really sensitive, I mean, it's just sometimes if you just shift your weight like that or drop your knee, you can sense that they're, you know, that you can make a delicate influence. I mean, so be it. If that's the case and they're really good like that, then and sometimes you've got to make your moves a little bit less uh, extreme. But this is where you work on this ability to talk without talking. In other words, that silent command system where you step back and you influence right, you step up, you influence left, and it helps you with those triples. When this bird, that bird goes off, so you, you're here, you do here, and he's a, he feels your movement because he's almost part of you. Not because he's afraid of you, but he's, he's a part of you. That's, it's just the communication you have. And, and you just, the more you do this kind of stuff, the better they get at it. And they just learn... And, and again, it's not out of fear or intimidation, it's out of habit, and so. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, yeah, you need to not just do it once every th two or three weeks. I'd do it a couple, three days in a row. Probably three is usually. Okay, and 
you know, it kind of depends on your schedule and your rhythm and routine, but, you know, uh, like at the beginning of the season, and, you, you know, when you don't have help, um, you know, dedicate a couple days to kind of advancing it and doing more of it. You know, if you only have a ch if you can only have room to do a quarter of it, that's fine. It, you know, it's not. But you know, I mean, you do it where you've got the one bumpers right up underneath the ledge of the house and in your front bushes, and you know, and you got a little bit of the driveway there you're playing with. I mean, there's lots of good. Most of the time, the best places are places you don't you wouldn't train otherwise. Okay, Lori, we we kept you waiting. So. I just think these things are so, and I did a whole master class with Ray Vogt on Wagon Wheel, you know. We talked about it, the whole benefits of it. And uh, there's just so many valuable things. What's that? Does your dog bite? Because that's not my dog. <laughs> I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. <laughs> okay, just pick up, uh, I want you to do a couple tips. Show me how, do counterclockwise, go to the left, and show me how she, show me your footwork and how, I mean in the zone of the mat. Don't get too, I just, don't. okay, good. Okay, now point that way. You can do it like, you know, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. So wet, I mean, we're gonna tear this lawn up a little bit if we did a ton of dogs. Okay, now do a clockwise. Now now do the rotate, the pull rotation. But go ahead and get back on the mat, you know, within reason. Okay, so let me just show you how the footwork I like. Well, I, and I, let me to tell her to sit and see if she'll stick next to me. Okay, so my move is this, not just this. It's sit, and, and, and again, if, and you can. You, this is always a tag, so I can go like this, and I can say here, boom, sit, perfect, sit, and I do it again, here, sit, here, sit, or get back on the mat if I want, sit, here, sit, here. Good. Sit. And if I want to do heel, I go heel. Heel. She said, who's this man? Sit. Okay. I don't want to break her concentration too much, but I wanted to demonstrate a little bit of that, that pull move. Okay. Pick up one of the white bumpers. I don't care which one. But on the mat. Real, I mean, you have to have at least one foot on the mat. Just want to keep you in the general vicinity. Okay, so why no hand? I want you to do, I want you to have it. Okay, so this is also where you discourage the parading. She doesn't need to do a Lambo leap after she picks up the bump and run into the stands and high five the crowd. I want her to, you know. So let's go for that white bumper. Good, that was perfect. Tell her to sit though. Step forward, no, just step forward. Sit, step forward, tell her where to look. Okay, pull her a little bit. Put your hand down and hold it there two seconds. Wait, step up just to click. Yeah. Sit. See, now she's starting to creep forward. I want to discourage that. Here. Go back to the mat. My correction for that can be just a firm here. Don't make her sit. Come on, guys. Don't get me started. <laughs> Take, grab the tip of the rope, drop, through, and you can throw, or I can throw the bumper back. Cause. Hand down and hold, when you get it right, okay, okay. Sit, sit, sit. Put your hand on her, hold it there for no, two seconds. No. Here. All right, that's fine. Heel. 
Now oh, she's you hear her making a little bit of noise, the dog? But we're get and we're creating a little anxiety. This is what we're gonna teach her to deal with anxiety. No. No. See, she says no more than I would. I would What do you think she's looking at? The red bumper? Okay. What do you guys think she's looking at? Yeah, she is. Yeah, I guess you're right. See, she's using the total negative approach. Okay, go back to the map. Pick up that white bumper. Yep. Okay. Nice, slow, solid delivery. Boom. Now I want you to line up and get ready to send for that red bumper. Because what I'll do with the whites, I come back and I point where I was, throw it back and move them off of it. Then when I go to reds, I work on my first look mechanics. Very nice. Red bumper there, yep. So now there's her first look. Boom, that's her first look. Not perfect, spine's not perfect, but now I want you to pick up that white bumper. You're starting to show off. I can't let you show off too much. <laughs> now, have your friend film you with, the, with your cell phone. You know, get your spine alignment so you can kind of go back and have a glass of wine and... and, and, and Look at your, your, your mechanics. See how it's going. Uh, okay, I want you back on the mat. You're getting a little sloppy here. And her spine's too far left, so you can get rid of the red bumper if you want to. Just dump it. Okay. Okay. I'm going to throw that white bumper back out first, and we're going to do the red bumper to the left of it. Hi. Give me your footwork. Actually, you're pretty good. Who wants to volunteer to come next? Okay. I'm going to demonstrate some wagon wheel casting too at some point here now. Um, and then we've got to make sure we leave time to set up this tune up. Go whatever you want to go for. I got to get these out of there. <laughs> I'm not crazy about her. Uh, your, your sending cadence is a little bit choppy to me. You go, what? You, you, you with me? I like to come in and, and again, methodically on your marks, get set, back. Here. Without snapping your hand. All right, fancy pants, you're gonna throw this one back. Here. And you're gonna, you're gonna try to do the one, the third tier one, up by the, up by the down spot.
now, you know, chances are you're going to have to know her and move up, but let's just do what you can. See what you can communicate. You actually got to kind of be. Back. Two. No, no. Make her sit. Sit. Go out there and take the bumper and just lay it down and escort her back. Sit. Sometimes you work on red zone stopping, don't you? Just drop it right there, all right? Don't cheat, bring her back. <laughs> Sometimes that's the hardest part. Okay, go right here. So you're gonna have moved up just a little bit. This is perfect, I mean, watch what's going on. No. no. Here. All right. Here. Here. Sit. Flip it out. Okay, move. Three steps towards the bumper. Right there. Right? Step up a little bit. Your spine's pretty good if you shift your weight. Okay, you shifted it a little. No. Don't look. Now move directly that way, even with the white bumpers. Right there. Very common, like that. This this is almost always how it goes. That's my fault. No, it's not. Oh, it's your fault that you weren't quicker. But you pointed her right. Walk directly that way. Right there. Stop her. Cast her to the stopper. Okay. There you go. Okay. Come on. You're going to do one till our next dog gets here. You're going to do one more sequence here. Okay. Come over here. No, we're not. We're done over on that area. Just you can leave both those bumpers there. No, just no, right there. Just right next to where you are. Don't worry about it. You're overthinking this. Come right here. Pick up that red bumper. Okay, we're going to pick up that red bumper, I'm going to throw it out, and we're going to do the red bumper to the left of it. Back. Okay. She's doing a Lambo, she's doing her, her, her uh, end zone dance. So I'm throwing this up. Red bumper to the left of it. If she lines past the white and the red, then you can handle her. If she doesn't get it. But if she goes for the white or the red, you're going to stop her and recall her and move up. So working on her discipline about stopping would be valuable. And just, I mean, it's not that she made the mistake, it's that she wouldn't listen to the, uh, and move straight that way, right there. So that's how you're gonna, I mean, day one, so quit there. So then you say, all right, we had some success, we pushed her. I want to keep pushing the envelope of what she's secure with. And Lori started to get a little anxious. She would go, no, no, here, good, but I mean, wait a minute, you gotta slow everything down there. But that's, 
And it makes you anxious and, you know, you're on stage, but she did good. I mean, and there's some real merit to that. Go ahead. Oh, would you have them spit it out right there? Yeah, I, I guess I would. Yeah, yeah, if you could say drop, leave it, no, here. I guess if it was that solid, they probably wouldn't have got it to begin with. But, uh, but sometimes you're like right at it, and they just, and they grab it right the last second. So sometimes that does happen. All right, so um, have you done any of this? What'd you, what did you do, mostly the, any reds? You just did the whites? you're okay with, uh, are the whites kind of okay-ish? We don't really need the third tier out. Um, and I don't think, let's just get, let's just, you guys take these with you. Okay. Well, we're not gonna, you know, she's gonna probably do, I, I mostly just wanna see her communicate online, do a few, maybe, maybe one second tier. I'm gonna, does anybody think they, uh, is anybody somewhat proficient on wagon wheel casting? Well, it's going to be the, it'd be, I'm going to have a, what do you do? The, do you do the angle backs and the overs? Well, why don't you go next? The angle ends aren't that big a deal. We'll pull the reds out of there. It's just going to be white, but I just want to, yeah. No, um, he, no lameness from his little spill yesterday? Good, good. Well, I didn't know. You don't know if he jammed his shoulder. Sure, it does. You didn't know if he jammed his shoulder or something a little bit, but he, he, I didn't see any stiffness after he ran. He kind of jumped that ditch and kind of hit it a little hard yesterday. Okay. Okay, I want you to do. Uh, first thing I like to do is work a little bit on wagon or on 360 healing. Mm -hmm. So just go counterclockwise. Oh, okay. After everything. And point at me. Okay, pretty reasonable. Okay, now go clockwise. Okay. Okay, go back to that bumper and let's send for that white bumper. Now, Again, I, I want you to drop your hand in, wait a second, and send. Don't, don't throw it in and send all simultaneous. Develop a rhythm. Okay, throw it back. Do the white bumper to the right of that one. Make them sit. Well, you, you can get a lot of mileage out of just making them behave. I'm okay. I just want him to. Oh, now, you're not, okay. Um, first of all, see where's where's the dog's spine? Way left. Too. Still, it's better. Go, go with it. He's still a little left, but it's better. There you go. You see where he went in his first three steps? That, you can please yourself. Did you, did you see that? The first three steps, he went exactly where her spine was pointed, which was right about here. Now, because I didn't want to micromanage the team because they were, they were a little smoother, but you can tell usually where you have them pointed when you see the first three steps off one. Did you see what he was I just a, Japanese. yeah. Hey, go for that one. Okay, good. He's getting, he's smoothing out a little bit. But you know, there's a lot of merit just in smoothing this out. 
coming in, healing, because there's a lot of kind of awkwardness. Now, part of it is the sloppy footing a little bit, but that's just another opportunity, isn't it? was not pointed there. What was, now, well, he might have been pointed, but okay, so, all right, but more importantly then, um, he's either used a sit whistle, but uh, we've got a sitting problem with this dog. No, he didn't sit when you tried to stop him to keep him from going for that bumper. He, he didn't listen to you, I guess is what it amounted to. You didn't blow a sit whistle. Behave at the end of blinds when he thinks he sees it. Well, he's got to sit. He's got to respond to your communication when he's near the end of the destination or you're never going to control him at the end of blinds. That one smells funny. <laughs> to that one. So get get the N O word ready. Or you <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Okay. We're going without a without a net. Do your best, with your best guess. You're not gonna get it, just, just, just send them. No! no! Sit! Sit! Make them sit. Scold them, make them sit. Throw the bumper down. Move, move right over here. Our, our, I don't think I can tap. Now this isn't about getting the red bumper, this is about him, and he's gonna get it here, but I think. No, well, we won there, didn't we? For, all right, now don't get mad now. You're fine. He, he listened to you. It isn't about the mistake. It's about the response to being no. Way more important than the mistake. And he did. He finally, you, you stopped him. For the first time, you stopped him. Look at him. Go with your best guess and go with it and be ready to know him. Take advantage of the drill. Well, it's better than going for the white, but it's, you know the answer to that, don't you? It's not really okay, but it's, but it's okay. Okay. It's an improvement to let him do it. That's what I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, he, he understood why you knowed him, but he still didn't respond to being no. He just went, oh, okay, I'll go somewhere else. And, no, make him sit. Then don't take the bump away from him. No, leave it. It's not yours. <laughs> Drop it on the ground. <laughs> Don't you're a little spoiled brat. You're fun. I right, move up here. <laughs> no, he's not a milk toast. <laughs> he's a cool dog. He's just gotta. He's gotta realize like no means no. I mean sit means sit. It's, no. 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 Sit. No. Stand on the bumper. Don't don't play hide and seek from him. Move to your right. This is not a, a getting the red bumper. This is train, and and not just ignoring her and blowing through. Okay, good. I hope he doesn't figure out the red too quickly because there's more value in him having to behave. 
when he wants to be a little bit of a dick, a little bit of a stinker. I think we're good here. I think we're good here. Yeah, I just wanted to demo it a little bit, and but uh, but. <laughs> you know, it's like when your kid throws his his, his food on the floor, and you, you want to laugh, but you shouldn't. So I got a question. I watched you yesterday playing tug of war with him. I watched you play tug of war with him. Right now? No, I watched you yesterday do it. With the bumper I did? What was it? I thought I was playing with his leech. Did I play with the bumper? I thought I saw a bumper. Okay. I mean, I that, that... I'm not going to say that I didn't. Well... <laughs> Then you're going to wonder why you got a dog that, when he gets older, starts freezing on stuff. I just, I think, you know, I love that he has fun. You don't have, this dog has a good attitude. Don't teach him to be a bad dog. You're doing a good job of that. I'm doing a good job. No, I'm just saying, I mean, I just want, if you take anything away from here, teach him that no means no, sit means sit, that, that, Work is work and play is play. That when he's released, he can have all the fun he wants. But he's going to have to be serious at times, and he's going to have to respect what you do. And if you don't gain that respect, I can give you, you can go to 19 million seminars, and none of them are going to work. You're going to have fun. You're smart. You can do this. Got it. You just got to. The, you know, the hardest discipline is on you, not him. I, I sense that too. Yeah. I said. So why is he allowed to jump on you right there? Why is he allowed to do that? Well, no, tell him sit. Well, it's not funny. Well, I mean, I, I'm laughing because he did that in my wedding. I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, if you invite him, great. But he makes too many. He's. He makes too many of those kinds of decisions on his own for me. So just have some rules when you're working, be strict about it, and then release him and let him do what he wants. I'm not telling him he can't have fun. He just does some things. Uh, um, well, and as you said, the things he's done are things that, one, I've either trained without knowing, yeah. or two, I've trained with knowing. Like his <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I come off. It's business. You walk off the honor. You say sit, and then you say okay, and then go ahead and do what you want. Roll in the pool. Do whatever you want to do. You've got to draw the line. Yeah, that's what I said. I think a lot of it is going to be you maintaining the structure. Okay, let's get the red bumpers out of here. What do you have a routine and what where you start here? Do you usually start with the back? Okay. Okay, so give do one of the backs. You know, either the left straight or the right straight. Good. So where are you going next? Do one of the angles. Those are silent for me. The, right, the angle backs are silent. This is where you start to teach. Silent means change direction. Verbal means go straight back. So in my world, I do a right straight back now. Now you got it offset a little bit. To get, do a right straight verbal back. See, that's where they'll make that. That's the more challenging. But now you're going to teach them how to take a verbal straight back. And a two-handed back drill is that, is that, but doing that every time. So step a little bit over here. Now you're going to use the voice first. There you go. Good dog. So you emphasize straight back. Throw it back. Oh, you got to get in the right spot, though. You're throwing them. Because now you get, I mean, that isn't. 
I want to go left straight back, but you don't have the bumper in the right place, so I got to move it. <laughs> so, I was 20, 21 years old, 1980, I was 18 then, I guess. Um, and I would go, I went to Rex's, and in 84, I spent about seven months there, and I would go out every day, and I would do 16 dogs on this. Every dog on the truck, over and over and over. <laughs> so I feel like there was an absolute right way to do it. So it's right straight, right angle, right straight, which you did. Now we're gonna go left straight back. Very nice. Receive them. I like to teach them the front finish and not have to, to come in right here, boom. She's got to do it. There, she did it there. <laughs> Throw it right at the birdhouse. Square them up. Left angle, silent, left angle back. No. See, now you're teaching them. No, don't scallop. Silent angle means change direction. Good dog. And this is another no-no drill. I guess I'd have to call Rex and he's dead, so I can't ask him. This, they were real anal about boom, boom, boom. Did Schrader do it this week? Because he was like. I like to work, I work my way down the sequence. I guess, now this is a verbal left straight up. I repeat it and it's gonna be hard. Because he's going to want to go to the angle. No. <laughs> I think it really, I think as you go, this really cements home the, the, the difference in the cast. Trying to just go random. I want to explain the difference between this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this, this and this. Boom, boom, boom. We always went straight, angle, straight, straight, angle, straight, angle, over, angle. I mean, and if we screwed it up, we repeated that three bumper sequence. Yeah, I've done that for lots of people, put the eight and then numbered them. So right, silent, angle back. Just let them. You can. Yeah, you can bring him into it. I think because the bumper's not there. He took a good angle back. The bumper kind of wasn't there. Just let him. Just bring him into it. That's not a mistake. <laughs> and now, if you have to put spray paint out to get it right, so you can see it, because you lose your reference. <laughs> well, you can be surprised. Okay, I want it right over. <coughs> All right. See, these are, you want to talk about improving memory. This improves memory because it, it requires them to stay focused for a long period of time. They want it, a lot of times they want it like, yeah, I'm getting bored. Well, they don't get to get bored. They got to kind of, now if they get hot or I usually, I, yeah, I guess I do. Okay, now right angle back, silent. I'm not crazy, but she didn't give a very good angle back, did she? She gave, like, I want you to be real specific, guys, okay. Let me tell you, my back is against the wall. My shoulder blades are touching the wall, right? Boom. Every arm position also touches the wall. I'm not like this. That's not touching the wall, is it? I'm like this. The straight up is here. You don't dip. You, may, you, you do this. 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 All right? 
Arms touching the wall. It's not behind you. It's, I always get Cindy Groveman on this. Where's Cindy's game? She goes, she, right? She gets all excited. She goes, over. And I'm like, wait a minute. You can't even see your arm. And take it from somebody who's got to use every inch of arm I have because if I start doing the, this, I mean, what do they see? Right? And here's the other thing. I did Trader, does Trader make you break your wrist on a cast? Rex, you have to give the home, I give the homecoming queen wave. Okay? Hunt test, guys, do it. I mean, that's the only way you can use. Boom, boom. It was two snaps. And Rex said to me, he says, if you don't break your wrist, I'm going to break it for you. Right? Yes, sir. Rex was 6'5", big guy. If you don't break your and so I tell you, okay. Um, you, your arm wasn't. It, I want just ju, exact. Just I want your angle is halfway between horizontal and vertical. So you know, just work on preciseness of your casting. Give a little, and you kind of went like this. You were kind of like just a little bit. I mean, I. I it's not crazy, but why not be why not be accurate? Uh, do left angle back. Okay, very nice. Now throw it back and do a left over. Then you're going to do a left angle and you're going to be done. So you got the idea, right? Oh yeah, why do the whole deal? Oh yeah, there's an angle in here. Okay. And they were, I tell you, you'd be surprised how quickly they pick that up. No. They'll pick, they'll pick, and, and BB. I step outside the circle, and I blow, I go BB, beep. And they'll just, they'll be like totally, and they'll really be sensitive to your arm position. They'll pick up this really quick. Now, not that you use it very much, but you use it sometimes. And if they're really aware of your arm position and, and the literal nature of where you're trying to direct them, they bec I mean, they'll be better hammering dogs. And if I get tons of mistakes, no. Now move them halfway between the mat and the over. So just like you did on the wagon wheel, or lighting, this is a wagon wheel. Just, if they make multiple mistakes and they're just not getting it, do this, watch, he'll get it this time. Okay, good dog. So it's all it's, okay? I mean, I think if you wanna get one more positive one on your own, go ahead, but I think you're done for all practical purposes. Huh? Well, if you wanna do the angle and then the over combination, go ahead. That's probably what I do. I'd say, like, you know, he had the most trouble with that. I pick up, you know, work angle, or, you know, and some days they'll get a little mental block, and all of a sudden they'll go, they can't do one of them right for whatever reason. It's not obvious. Do we have any dogs that are overcasters that like change direction too much here? That because I'm going to show you a two-handed back version, and then we're going to move on. Why don't you go get your dog? Well, or do you want to wait and do the? Um, who, who are we going to do for demo dog on the um, um, on the tune-up drill? We can do like two dogs on that, and then we'll probably want to do lunch, huh? Okay. Um, I don't care. Um, huh? Go ahead and get your dog. Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. So let's say, you know, in some dogs, the and it's oftentimes the old. Overcompliant dog who's like really trying to stay out of trouble. So you give a straight up left and they give you an angle because they say, well, if you want me to change direction, I'm going to change direction twice as much just to be safe. Right? And some of them get into that. And like now you can't get a straight back to save your soul. They just like always overcast. Well, I'm going to show you the version of the, of the wagon wheel drill that works. It's called a two handed back drill. Okay? And you, you, you end up actually um, almost doing a little bit of it when you do the right straight, right angle, right straight, but everything becomes a straight back and you rotate around. 
okay? And, you, and, what, and, what, and what the dogs will learn on a 200 back drill is they almost pivot in place and go straight back. They, under, they don't do this. They, so when you're practicing teaching a dog to get straight back, like if you're doing a keyhole between those pine trees, and you get them lined up and you, and, and you, and you want to go back, and you really just want them to turn and go straight away from you, because if they're ping-ponging, they're behind that pine tree, they're behind that one, and, you're, and it's frustrating, two in the back drills would it. It's not, I think the essentials are the wagon wheel lining, eight-handed casting. Two in the back, good thing to do. Some dogs don't change direction enough, and it's probably not the drill you want to do all the time, but it does. And if you're going to work on essentially a no-hands back, you can offset a little bit back, and you can practice them really going. Now, you, if you do a no hands back on two and a back drill, if you're not offset, you don't, can't hold them responsible for turning the wrong way. But it is a way to kind of emphasize that. So these are, these are, these are good things to do. So we're gonna, right after this is over, we'll walk up and I'll start picking out a handful of uh, blinds for the, do we have, does anybody have flags? Like the little, you got a half a dozen of them or something like that? Huh? Yeah. Would you get a, uh, six or eight of them? Or maybe even, do you have a nice bundle of them? Grab, whatever, we're good. Because I want to mark the blinds, because the lines rotate and the, and, the, and the destinations change. So we'll set one up that looks kind of interesting. And I'll tell you, you know, and maybe we'll put a chair out. And, do we have a diamond or so we can put a person in the field, a stick man, and we can just do a couple, three different things. But there's a lot of nice features. Of, of, you know, there's a, some side slope. There's some keyholes with the pine trees. Um, I like to do, I love to put a cover line in it, like either build some branches or in the south, you get these volunteer pines around the edges of the properties so you can you could create a little distinct cover line that you have to handle through. Or you could stack some hay bales up that you have to handle over. We're going to go up to the top of the hill and work back this way. What? Tell, okay, that's what I'm, what's in there? Oh. What, what is it? Um, groundhog holes? Okay, well, maybe we could, and so maybe we, I put one out and we only run a few of the blinds and I just, for demonstration purposes, show you what a tune-up would look like. I wondered, that's why I was asking, because I thought like, I wonder if there's a reason that's not cut. Well, Okay, well, I may set it up and not run dogs through it, but it would, uh, if I did a tune-up drill, you'd have to go through there because it's a significant part of the drill. But we won't run a dog, but I can still show you what it would look like. Okay, um, have you done wagon wheel casting drill? Okay, so let's, um, let's start by doing, well, let's do just what she did initially. Is that, are those bumpers uh, visible enough? Yeah, I guess they are. This will go pretty quick, but I'm going to show you a, a two-handed back version. Okay, so um, do it, whatever, wh you either do a right or a left straight back, I don't care. Now, it needs to be verbal because you're emphasizing going straight back. Now, that, that bumper's kind of sideways and not very obvious, so it's a little more, it's less than ideal, but, but give a right verbal straight back. Okay. Now, have him sit down facing you and throw the same bumper back out. Now do a left straight back to the bumper you just threw out. A left straight back to the bumper you just threw out. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, good. Now receive them at the mat again and throw it out again. Okay, here's where it turns into a two-handed back drill. Susie, so now we're going to set them up. And I want them pointed this way towards me. Is she paying attention or not? Come, come this way. Now what would normally be the right angle back, is another straight back. Got it? Yeah, you're going to that. Now, okay, there you go. Now the easier way is to give a right straight here. Because you, okay? That's the way I would probably start it. Now do it again and throw it out and do a left straight back to the same spot. I mean, maybe Bill had his own twist. I don't know. I mean, there's not, you know, listen, this is, I'm just showing you the stuff the way I was taught. Now, you got to get yourself set up so now that's a left straight back to the same bumper. You got to move over. No. See, now he overcasted, right? Yeah. You've got to kind of get yourself set up in your real... Now, here's the, here's the challenging thing on giving a real straight back. Look at me. A lot of people do this. They dip their shoulder to the wrong side. You can't do that. You've got to not drop the shoulder because the dog sees... He, he handles as much off your torso as he does your arm. So you've got to just do... And Mike would always micro step. He would do this. So you didn't do this. So you don't want to do this. Yes, correct. Now, if, to make your life easier, I step over a quarter step. Okay, there you go. You're doing a left because you've already done a right. You're going to go verbal left straight back. No. And when they start to get this, They'll almost pivot right on the mat itself and go straight back. They re there you go. All right, now receive them. Now we're going to do the one to the right of that is two backs again. You with me? Now to make it harder, if you throw it back, if you start with the left hand, that's more challenging because that's the, you're, you're casting back towards the one you just threw out. In the beginning stage, Now you got to set yourself up to make that a back now, don't you? That one. There you go. Now she starts with the right. It's a friendlier version. But as they get better at it, see that's the easier version. The harder version is to give the left straight there. Now she's going to do the left now, but it's easier because you just throw it out and cast the one you just threw. But it's a two-handed back drill. You got the idea? Yeah. You know what, it, it's just another good exercise in communication and understanding. So square them up. And if you want to practice on getting your dog to dip and square up, that'll be a good opportunity. All right, see how he spun a little tighter there? That's really what you're trying to communicate. I mean, I think we're good with that. I mean, I think we showed that enough to us. Uh, to demo it so that that's so those are the three versions of wagon wheel drills and they're real staples and and real valuable at any level i mean it's good short casting i mean that's not field trail hunt test that's just dogs okay yeah okay um, because a dog likes to scowl back in the same direction, is that what you're saying? Oh, so he makes big wide turns on the... Well, this is, this is it. This is the one drill that really works on it. Um, I mean, this, shorter than this, you mean? This is, 
this this will this will do what you're looking for. And you could do th well, just with three, but as they make the mistake, now what I'll do, the dog that usually makes that big loop makes a lot of mistakes. So if I move closer to the back bumper after a couple of recalls, then it becomes, and then I, you know, I'm, and I'm not against flipping that bumper out and casting to the bumper I just threw to kind of, kind of pattern them if they're really confused. But that would be the routine there, okay? All right, let's go to the top of the hill and let's pick out a tune-up drill. We may, because I don't know the property when I looked, I didn't have anybody to tell me the spot that I really liked had some factors of not safety in it. That's why I kept looking. I said, I wonder what that's going on in there. But that's what we're talking about. So but, you're right. Yeah, you're gonna because you're doing a left, a right, a left, a right, a left. You're using one same hand, same two hands. Okay, at, yeah. at the same level. Yep. Okay. Huh? We're done here with that. Flowers. Flowers. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to bring the speaker up there? Does somebody mind grabbing that? Okay. Oh yeah, okay. I you can see the the roughness in here. They're probably all top. and the pine tree, and I'm gonna keyhole right up to that, okay? So I start picking out ones that are obvious. Now, and I keep, you know, what typically happens is the starting lines move one way where the destinations oftentimes move the other. That's more common than not. Now, it may be, now, because I'm trying to revisit factors, like a lot of times I like to pick a factor and hit it two or three times from different angles in a tune-up reel. So those are some of the things I'd look at. Another thing, do you guys ever do, have to do a remote cast, where you set the dog down like on a, like if he's on a beaver house and you're hunting and you've got a cast, dogs don't like remote casts. They get all weird about it, right? They get like, what am I doing out here? It's, it's so what a remote cast is. Anything that your dog isn't good at, that makes him weird, that makes him nervous. Tight blinds near a gun. Angling off a road. Going tight to a gun. A remote cast. Um, a lot of these properties, you've got some, have mounds on the property, okay? To run off. But what we do a lot with them, we run from behind them and they can't see where they're going. They don't like that. Catching the corners of the mounds. They'll either run up the middle or they're going to run around the mounds. So get, you know, judges will use that to to divert a dog and make it hard to get a good initial line. Um, no, no, a line of hay bales, three or four hay bales that you got to, that you got to handle over, it, like a log in the field or a pile of brush. Um, right? You like those kind of things? Okay. Sometimes you know you can use a plastic pipe, plastic PVC drain pipe. You can drag it up there. Um, Two things I like on no-nos. Mostly my no-nos, and I call no-nos because I'll know them and recall them and expect them to line over it, are going to be, I don't know, I probably wouldn't do them much further. I'd rather, see the, the yellow stakes are there where the drive goes down? I probably won't do them any further out than that. They're probably going to be more in the foreground. And more often than not, they're not going to be much further than the, from here to the back of that that silver pickup truck that's parked backwards. Most of my recalls in those are going to be not much further out than that. But I, what I like to do is also put an obstacle in the field that you have to handle with. That's that log or that patch of cover that's online. Trying to practice to, to line it up and pass through an obstacle is really hard. Really hard. So. I like to have a no-no in the foreground and then an obstacle and I'll catch the no-no on one blind, I'll handle over the other obstacle on another blind and then I'll move over and go over the no-no and the obstacle. Okay, so you hit your no-no up front, handle over the no-no, move over and line over and handle over. Same deal. So you, so you ain't got to move your lines, right? Yep. 
Great thing to do. Add a, add a diamond and do that blind right at... Now, the dogs aren't that weirdy about a diamond. It's almost like a blind marker sometimes for them. But if you put a person out there, or in your case, maybe you put that holding blind because that's like a gunner. And maybe you put a, you know, something where that looks like there's a person in it and you gotta run right at the deal. And then you gotta run just by it. The thing I do on tune-up drills though, because the blinds a lot of times are real close to one another, I typically single plant. I don't want to get into correcting a dog for picking up a blind from a previously retrieved site. So I'm gonna, they're, they're made, they're not made, they're made not to do a lot of correcting if you can help them. The correcting is mostly attrition, redoing it, lots of handling, and a tune-up drill, you, 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 you're, you're almost always going to do three to four days, and more common, four to five days. They, they can be five days in a row, but they should be at least five days within a 10-day period. They should be like pretty much on top of each other, okay? Um, so now we've talked about tune-ups and we've looked at some factors. Go ahead. It's almost one o'clock. Okay. And we don't want lunch to run into dinner. Right. All right. <laughs> we still have the flyers. Yep. Okay. So should we just? Did we talk about this enough? I mean, maybe we're, obviously yeah. we don't have time. If anybody has it. questions about it, right. they can ask now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think I, I think it's uh, we get long-winded and we start talking, and it's one thing leads into another, and you're right. We're going to run out of time. I think you get involved in the work. Is there a standard length of these? Um, you know what? I mean, the blinds I described, 100 yards or under, a lot of them are 50, 60 yards away. One of the most valuable things, but even just walking around talking about it and looking at these factors. Hope gives you an idea how to do it. Okay. So even if they go around the left side, they gotta jump in a little bit of water. But there's no swings. It's just a marsh, you know, they may splash. But it just makes it makes them have to work for the bird.
If you're ready, lower flyer guns, go ahead and let it rip, but if you're not, just give me a wave when you are ready. Ready. Go. Sit. Fifty-five. Heel. <laughs> Leave it. Well, that's Leave her it. Voice. That's her voice. Dead. That's her dog. Leave it. Voice. Deny the flyer twice, you're telling them no. Now, one option would be to. I mean, you can do the blind at the end. Certainly. It was more angled back. Yeah, I, I, I wanted it a little bit further. I keep forgetting to peek at the flyer. Okay, Jake, single. He went on the line, I sent him, but it was too fast. Here. Plus, he went where I was. Here. Here. Feel. <laughs> Sit. Wow, you concentrate. Here.
it'll close that window. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he wasn't sure where it was, which blind it was coming from. Okay. Are you guys okay with this? Yeah. Now, you know, again, you, we can go up and do the blind from the other side of the mound for some dogs that going by that flyer at that distance isn't going to nope. work for you. Shit. You can certainly do, now again, I only did the poison bird combination with this dog because I thought it was best for this dog. So don't feel like Heal. that has to be your test. Feel. And for both, I'm, feel. I'm all about a challenge. Feel. I want to be entertained. You only live once. Here. Here. Feel. Found the That's my number. <laughs> it, the, the recurring theme of the gun thrown across an obstacle, you know, we did it in a dry ditch a couple times. Set. 
it's kind of reward for the flash of hoops. What's not to like? You could always add to that. Huh? You could add an honor to it. Yeah, well, we're going to definitely honor, you ought to honor, um, over here. Yeah, yeah, you definitely want to honor the fly. Oh. Uh, yeah, I guess I would honor it between the, the line and the, right over here. Yeah. Do we have one of the other uh, running dogs out? Yeah. 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 The beating will continue to morale improve. <laughs> <laughs> until it quits, or until it quits raining. <laughs> <laughs> Snowing. I think he was ninety two. <laughs> <laughs>
I do bird in mouth just like you did, mm -hmm. I treat it like a mermaid bird and I wouldn't send with my hand either. easiest memory bird of the bunch. Now, unless you want to do all singles. I would like to try another memory bird. Okay, and I would suggest. I mean, he's done poison birds before, he's just not running well this week. Flyer one, Clippy two is a double. Yeah. 
Checking for meatballs out there. That was a good time. <laughs>
I guess we're gonna. Are you taking the four wheeler out? And how are we doing this? I think the birds are already down there. They're just gonna walk them over. I think. Oh, Dan. Um, Rick wants you to meet him over by the trucks over there, and I guess you guys are gonna walk some other crate of flyers down or something. Thank you. Pat, can you talk about like when you're looking at a test, like, and you have to decide, sort of like yesterday, which bird to pick up when? Can you help? help yeah, it's clear some... such a great discussion, you know. And um, so you know, trying to decide what order to pick up, um, or at least what order to set up for. You know, sometimes you, the dog tells you he's going to do something different, but. Um, there's times where you like to pick up birds as pairs because you think you can make it sense out of the situation. You know, some quads will have, you know, you'll, there's like a double here and a double here, so maybe you like to do them in, in sync. Um, on this test, well, let's say this was a triple. Let's, you know, say you shot all three birds down and you ran the blind. What would you pick up after you picked up the blind? Uh, probably... I mean, I go next shortest. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, you could go, you know, I mean, if then, and then it would be this, and then probably the flyer, and then the middle. But some people would come back and get the blind, get the flyer, get the short bird, get the middle bird. Um, I wouldn't say, because it's not, again, I don't put a range finder on. It has to be significantly shorter, and it has to be clearly shorter for me to say, I'm going to, you know, unless I just wanted to establish control. But on game day, I usually try to get a bird that's going to make the next bird easier, that's going to help them make sense. Sometimes using the old ball to help you. And they usually, most dogs will push off the previous line. So, um, you know, picking this up, and then they're going to, if they pick up the flyer, they're going to, they're going to push off. It'd be hot, you know, you wouldn't typically, the middle bird is almost always going to be the last bird retrieved on this test. But, um, and when there's one of those tests that you know that you, what you think is going to happen doesn't happen, yeah, yeah. and that happens a lot. The and the dogs just didn't see it the way you thought they would see it. Yeah. And you start to watch patterns develop. And sometimes there's usually an order to the test that helps the dogs make sense out of it. And it's not always obvious. So being kind of be intuitive and watch how the dogs behave. Um, and there's oftentimes little factors in the foreground that don't look like much, but it turn out to be pretty significant. Yeah. Like a little dip or a little clump of grass or a little mound. So uh, part of that is just watching the situation. This wouldn't necessarily be one, you know, one that there's going to be a lot of decisions to make, but some of them. But yesterday was hard to tell which one you, you know. Oh yeah, on the, you know, when you pick up that flyer and you had the two birds on the outside, is it easier to get the left bird first? I usually watch and see what bird is easier to get if they don't remember. Then I tr then I try to save it for last. Because I'll, I'll put it this way. I always used to say this. Now, you guys don't do many quads, but Here. I'd say the second bird retrieved, they remember. The third bird retrieved, oftentimes, they're just trying to stay out of trouble. So they're trying not to make a mistake. So sometimes they have to... So if if, if, you, if you take that into, into consideration, it may help you say, all right, if the, sometimes the bird that they need to mark the most, I'd like to try to get second, but sometimes it's not doable. But they're pretty relaxed on the second retreat. Now, as they get more iffy, they, have, they end up leaning on you and leaning on the rules a little bit more. So if, if the rules are going to hurt you on that next bird, sometimes I'm going to pick try to pick it up earlier. If the rules are going to help you, then I don't mind saving it to the end. Um, now, again, with that being said, every test is unique, and there's always some sort of degree of that. That, And then you watch the dogs, and then you thought you had it all figured out, and it's nothing like you imagined. But, but it is a great discussion, you know, when you try to decide order to pick up. Okay, I guess we're ready. Are we ready? Does that truck yep. need to leave before He'll, we start, or no? He'll, good? On. Huh? He'll back out of there. Oh, he's good? He doesn't have to come through the test? No, he's good. Okay. What are we going to do? Thank you. Um, I'd like to do what um, the test dog did. So the flyer. flyer. Off the flyer. Right and then do the single on no. the right, then pick up the flyer. I think that's a good way to do it. Yes, because I, I want to. 
Okay, flyer single, flyer single.
safety. So what if he decides to go for the flyer instead of um, first? I don't know that he will. I'm no, just asking. No, if he does, we won't. I, I, I won't let him go like this. Okay. I will stop him or cast him. Or okay. All right. Sick. Try to stop him. Sick. Or Dale, tackle him. Heal. Heal. Dan, get up. Heal. Dan, get up. Dan, one. Flippy, two. No. Dan, one. Flyer, one. When you, now that you see the track, you can see that that, that track is actually fairly tall there.
go see how. Okay. Dead. Again, boy. Just wait a second. Go. Dead. Go ahead. Dead. Over. Over. Okay. Go see. Hey, hey, over. Hey, hey, hey. All right. Let him on it now. Okay, that's enough. Let him on it. I just didn't want to switch. All these New York Times birds, or this bird, you sit down and you read the New York Times until we figure it out. Ha <laughs> ha 
so worried about the ditch, you, you didn't ha you didn't put him to, put him on the blind. I've got you know, to do some therapy right, things right. like that, but just yeah. But I, but I, I, I like what you're doing here. So this is good. Okay, Heel. I'll review the order. Flyer one, J two, Clippy three, triple.
So when you're judging a handle, you're still trying to judge the quality of the mark. And you know, hopefully he'll come up with this kind of quickly. But to me, that's a, this dog had a mark. He just didn't come up with a bird. So versus a dog that doesn't have any idea where the bird is and is going off to the right, and you just handle over there. This is a hence a semblance of a mark. You know, still got to come up with it. Oh, hey, this is a super four plan on my part. No, it's not a super four plan. He just... This is... This is obviously just... I'll tell you what, we've got two in a row with very similar hunts. And almost... Every, yeah, I saw the splash. It was in the... Just stand up. Give it down. Over. Over. Yeah, now you gotta put the best you can on the bird. He felt like he'd been there a couple times, didn't he? But he's gonna get it. I don't, I can't. Right there. And it was just black. I'm still on that one. Yeah. No, he doesn't have it yet. Now you got a little fun. So what's going on there? Is the bird just laying really low? I'm asking now. Clicky. Okay. Sit so he can see it, he just... But it's just kind of locked. Did you see him throwing his nose up right there? Yeah, I saw that. I've got a feeling he's... That's like, and then when I went down, yeah, it's like he made game right down there at the end of the pot. And he did. Yep. Good Lord. And that did. Well. Yeah, he winded it when he was down kind of at the right end of the pot. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't put the bird in their mouth, and then you just can't explain it, but this is... But I tell you what, I can't think of a more likely hunting bird than to land in that rough toolies in the yeah, dark, you know, having to get in there and root it out and have trouble finding it. I mean, it's just one of those.
let him get out of there. And Stand up, gun fake a throw, or gun yeah. silent rethrow. Yeah. But yeah. I don't have gun. I, I would walk con a little bit contrary to the dog's hunt pattern, but you're right. When you walk right at the bird, you kind of push him right yeah. out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we have a guest speaker tonight, huh? Veterinarian coming in Here? right before dinner. Right there. Oh, excellent. <laughs> awesome. Where'd you go to school? Uh, undergrad at Penn State, best school at UPenn. suggestion knowing what you have learned about this guy um, what do you suggest well I suggest <laughs> the only okay go ahead go ahead the no only, you go well I guess I should you know you go flyer single single here move up and maybe do you do the blind and then finish with the mark or do you do one two three and then do a blind are you are you thinking of doing a you're not thinking of doing a multiple, are you? I did think about doing a double, but I'm afraid if he starts mucking around in yeah, there he won't be able to just, breathe. Yeah. So after we've watched a couple dogs and have so much trouble with that bird as a go bird. I know, I was like, Oh, the double looks great. You know, challenging, but I thought yeah. he will be gassed if he comes out of there. Um, let's do the fly let's do let's do flyer single, right single. Uh, and maybe Six. the middle single, then move up and do the ball. Or maybe give him the mark. One yes. of those. Yeah, let's do those two first and then play. Yep. Okay. Fly or single? Heel. Uh-uh. Heel. Come here. Heel.
walk out there and look at the fall area, you'll see what's going on. There's nothing wrong with that honey shell. Nothing wrong with that. Come on, I'll just finish the job here, boy. Gotta just... The scent must get trapped in there a little bit, because you think they're just about... I think I do want to move up a little bit. And no, no, we're definitely going to move up. Come on, it's a matter of whether we. I think we're going to move up and do the blind, and then finish with your bar. Come on, let's go. Out of boy. You've gotten better as it's gone. Mm -hmm. Come on. Let's go. You're out of breath, sucking wind. Like Did you guys know there was a national six. amateur championship? In, right near here, at Meadville was headquarters. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Early 70s. Heel. Take a breath. Time to turn it where Take a breath. Heel. Heel. No. Ever heard of a dog named River Oaks Quirky? Sit. Sit. Highest pointed retriever in AKC history. 500 and some all these points. He won that national. A client of mine judged the national. Let's go. He said it was Heel. done. National <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just go a little bit ahead of the, right there on the apron of the gravel there. Have at it. Baby's 
Changing somebody out there, so oh, okay. who's headed up? Yeah, they're headed up. That's uh, Susie. Susie's up there. Well, cool. I'm excited that you're going to talk to her. What, what are you going to talk about? Well, and this is a new version, so we'll see how it goes. I kind of put more field stuff in it and stuff like that. 
like that rather than the pet owner stuff. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. you a good boy. He's Unfortunately, yeah, I was going to use it as a warm up at home, except my husband decided to head back to the bed. The nerve. So you the guys nerve. are my guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Oh, yeah. Francy Pants is coming. Yeah. Okay. What do you think you want to do? Well, how about we do three singles? Okay. I think that would be good for her. And what do you think about me? Do the blind at the end? Yeah. What do you think about me just giving her a little bit of reminder before she yeah, goes? Yeah. You think that's, that's yeah, good? Yeah, yeah. Just Absolutely. I really don't want to reward or, you know, she got a pretty good correction yesterday, which yeah. I'm fine with. Yeah. But, Oh, when she broke, that's right. Oh, yeah. okay. So do you want to start with the dead bird? Or do you want to shoot the flyer? No, let's shoot the flyer last. Shoot the flyer last. Okay, go so around bang, the horn, right to left. Bang, bang, bang. Okay, three singles right starting with Cliffy. Snappy yeah. little knee action. doing that for a while. Huh? Yeah. It's like you were real calm. She sat nice. Boom. And she had a really nice mark. Good. Okay, Hi, single on Jake. I have to remember I'm doing a uh, I'm doing a Purina master class with Dr. Arlie Reynolds from uh, you know if that means he was a Chief of Nutrition, or Assistant Chief of Nutrition at Cornell for a while, but then he's a research scientist for nationally for a while, and then he's a dean at the school in Fairfax. And I actually worked for him at uh, the spend the year with the world. Yep, yep. Which was fun. In between 38 years of retriever training. <laughs> but it was a great experience. But June 9th, we're doing an hour call, the Q&A deal at Make sure. Three little 
old marks, huh? Even the decent sir. We out of here. All right. We'll try again. Good girl. Right here. Just be careful she didn't run into one of those poles with that wing over her. Here. You know what I mean? Just kind of. Here. Good. I've seen some dogs get hurt come flying in with that wing over the eye and hit a bird right after. Hit a bird. Run into you yeah. or. One, the right hand bird, two, probably? Yeah. I guess so. I know. I know. Well, here. We've had two dogs. Okay, double. Flyer one, yeah. Clippy two. She said, I was looking for another duck. You did. <laughs> I gave you a challenge. And you did it. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'll just get it tomorrow. Or give, oh, it, to, or give it to Laurie, whatever. Okay. okay, fire one, quick me two. Yeah. 
Good girl. All She was right. I mean, to be honest with you, if she had gone perfectly straight, she would have went right to the bird itself. Or slightly right of it. But I just sense that Heel. she didn't make, you know, Heel. I still like the reference where the bird came from. Heel. And it, you know, does that make sense? Yes. Um, Maybe influence, uh, identify the gun, influence the bird. And you went right at the bird. I did. Right at the bird. And you know what, if she, and, or slight, you know. And I guess the way the dog had been going, I thought, you know, yeah. be a little safer. Okay. Yeah. Do a little gun right there. Dead. 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 Influence to the gun a little bit, you might have won this thing. <laughs> oh. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say she runs straight either, because she can do well, that. When I watched her here, she ran pretty straight. Yeah. So that's the that's the big battery you bought, huh? It's a Sony battery. I don't know. I think that's what it was saying on when I was reading about. <laughs> okay, Lord. You ready? What you gonna do? Uh, she's not ready to do a poison flyer. 
put it, are you going to do the blind first? I'm going to do the blind first. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. You. Okay, so we're going to do the blind first. So do not put a duck in the, in the boiler yet. You. And then a triple. Oh my God. I'm game. I mean, you know, the, the blind first, it's not a poison bird, but it's still pretty challenging. Taking the warm up here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not going to matter. <laughs> Off goes the warm up. station shoot three times. I just want a lot of... You already told them? Yeah. Okay. What? Oh. What'd you have for breakfast? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're like, bring it on today. <laughs> <laughs> Sixty. She says, I want the flyer. Ginger. She faded with the wind a little bit, though. So, uh, she scared me a little bit because I said she, I know she's going for the player, but she may have been that one. Set yourself up. Wait, what bird are you going for? Short bird? Get her lined up. Pull her over. Pull her over. Pull her over. my first look, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Ginger! I want you to pull her over. Because you're going to have to put some between her. She may go in there and get it, but she's, she's got deep of the sh short right bird and wide your sweet spots between the bird and the gun. And you just, and you're a little fast. You didn't
didn't let her kind of clear her head. You just went, you, you had like a hot potato in your hand. You wanted to get rid of it too fast. She's on it though. I think with a little more, if you'd have given her a little bit more help there, I think she'd have gone in there and gobbled that up. Now take your time here on this one. Well, you gotta let the Polaroid develop. If she's not, chances are she's not just gonna stick her neck out and remember it. So she kind of faded into it on there and she almost got it two times already. So let her identify that holy blind. Let her catch her breath. Three retrieves already out there. Yeah. Let's see, she's just, she's just a little foggy, so you can let it clear her head a little bit. Now you gotta push her. This is like that wagon wheel lining drill now again, isn't it? Trying to figure out which. Push too hard, she's gonna fly. <laughs> I thought you blew the sit whistle. I mean, there's some, not about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's a couple things that went on here that led to her, on, her uncertainty. Here. That, Does she kind of, she had, she, uh, Jake, stand up. Jake, stand up. Wave your arms a little. A little holler. Okay, that's enough. You can sit down. All right. Her in there. Ginger! She didn't have clean paths to her other retreat that I think kind of led to some like uncertainty. Like she she faded right on the flyer. She almost went to the middle, so it was like there wasn't really distinct areas of previous lines. Those goofy lines I think really kind of played with her head, and it was like I don't know if it's okay to go in there. Come on, Junior. So we're about. That was fun. Thank you, Lloyd. Lloyd! Or are you going to quit feeding her? <laughs> Thank God. So how many we got left? <laughs> Two. Two. All right. 425. All right. <laughs> I may have went over this morning, but we did okay here. That was good this morning. Good. Yeah, that was fun, yeah. Good, really good. yeah. Good. Well, it's good to have those few. Oh. So this mic system I'll set up so you can use tonight in there. Is that okay? Yeah. Because it's got a lapel. It'll it'll make talking easier. She does. <laughs> Glad you said it. I was gonna say something. <laughs> These are your friends, huh? <laughs> what you gonna do? I'm thinking a double. Flyer one, right for two. Okay. Yes. Then the blind. And then that finished it up. Flyer one, clicky two, double. Here. Because they're changing flyer codes or something, so Here. might be a little delay. Oh. They're, they had to get flip, change the flyer codes, so they're not going to run out of words on the top three. Uh, Cork. 
Milwaukee won like 72, 73 or something. But there was a national amateur here in Pennsylvania. And it was at Pima Tuna Grizzle. Right? been a pretty good little mark. We've had, you know, we've had some really good jobs, and we had like two gorilla gar gargantuan hunts, and then Just didn't, it felt like the wind died or something because I thought usually they've been winding it when they came around the back side. Thank you, man. Oh, we're going to do the blind next and then the middle two. Well, we got lots of answers on this, didn't we? Oh, yeah. A lot of varying work, some really good, some not so good. Good dog. Good try, baby. Oh, it's alive. Good.
if you look at the ditches, there's not much to it. But it's just a change of cover. I mean, there's no, again, there's no water. They're just running down the bottom. and get him a verbal and just and get him just get him to punch across it. Didn't work. <laughs> that was a little factor to the trail. Say handle to the bird. I mean, that would have been better to not let him get back across the ditch again.
side. But, yeah, our opportunity to put them on if it's not letting them come back to this side, right? And I'll tell you guys, you know, because handling on a mark is so accepted in your game, you got to you got to get good at it. And you, you know it's hard to know right where that bird is. And so yeah, you got to, you got to. Huh? I had a little idea. Yeah. But not a real good idea. That's you have to kind of be systematic. You know, you know it's across the ditch. You know it's in that flat. You, you and can't let them get that way. Yeah. When you let them, I mean, you know, when you let them come back through the ditch, you just made your job. You turn what could have been an okay handle into a messy handle. Come on, boys. Okay. What you gonna do, girl? Um, I went to fire out of the river. Like. You wanna do the double then? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, we're good. He really hasn't been hugely successful. So, are you? <laughs> tell me what you're thinking. Are you thinking a double blind and then a single? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay. single in the one, middle. Clippy two. Sit. Um. And Clippy, if you just kind of stand, you can. I know you have to sit down Thank or, you. or reach over to, to launch, but we want this is the dog that's more used to visible okay. gunner, so. We're going to have the flyer gun stand and clippy stand. And it will be flyer one, clippy two. Yeah, you can even sit outside the pulling line too. Yeah, perfect. You good with that? I am. We'll see if he is. <laughs> well, he's got to work through this stuff. I don't want to keep shooting him singles, but, I, you know, I don't want to overwhelm him either. No, you're right. I want to keep him on that hairy edge. Hairy edge. Are they ready? Cool. All right, double. Fly on one. Look at you. Double. Yep. Yep. Nice. You know what? He's in the cold. Come here. Come here. He's in the cold. Yeah. Well, why don't you step forward? Here. I'm just getting a clear view. Oh, wait, wait. 
my gun marked. Here you go. Here you go. Come here. got him weirded out is just the, or is it just different grounds and different atmosphere? Both. Because he, you know, he was nowhere near this kinked up. And I, I, I'm, I'm going back to my inflection, like, am I sending him too hard? Am I not sending yeah. him hard enough? Am I saying sweet, like too firm? Like my inflection. Let's do a single on Jake. Let's do the single one. My inflection is what's confusing me because... Yeah, I mean it is. Your voice is cracking a little bit, but I mean it still seems like... Yes. You guys can just sit while we do the blind and then we'll be done. 